questions. And uh, before I call the next debate, can I just inform the Parliament that uh, I have confirmed with business managers that all the votes from yesterday will be taken at decision time today. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a Scottish Labour Party debate on the economy, and I ask Jackie Bailey to open. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome every opportunity to debate the Scottish economy. To my mind, nothing is more important. A strong economy and a strong society are but different sides of the same coin. You simply can't have one without the other. But it is also an opportunity to reflect on where we are, what more we need to do to support business and the workforce in an ever-changing landscape. Nowhere is that more evident or challenging than in the oil and gas sector. Now, let me take a step back and consider the current state of the economy. And, you know, the picture is not good overall. And let me just say to the SNP benches, of course there are things to welcome, like the positive figures for inward investment. But, you know, we need to recognise the scale of the challenge we face so that we can take the right action to turn things around, to support businesses, to grow employment, to contribute increased revenue to fund our public services. I believe, presiding officer, these are aspirations that we all share. But the Scottish economy is facing an uncertain future. Over the past week, several respected organisations have cast doubt on Scotland's prospects for economic growth in the coming year. I hope they are wrong, but you know, hope is simply not enough. We need action, not complacency. The Ernst & Young Scottish Item Club has downgraded its forecast for GDP growth for 2016 to 1.2%, and they note the continued gap between Scottish and UK growth. What they also tell us is that that gap is growing and the difference has been much larger than in previous years. This followed comments by the Scottish Government's own chief economist, highlighting that the pace of growth in Scotland last year at 1.9% was significantly below that of 2014, which grew at a rate of 2.7%. Today, there is a suggestion coming from respected economists at the Fraser of Allender Institute that we might even be on the very brink of a recession, not something any of us would want to see. Now, a slowdown in growth underpins some of the recent increases in unemployment and drops in employment. Figures published today show that there's been a drop in employment levels in Scotland the only area of the UK to register a fall. We must not allow this to develop into a trend. And meanwhile, construction and manufacturing, oil and gas, as you would expect, have all reported reduced activity and business optimism has plummeted. Indeed. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. for taking the intervention and also say in the interest of balance, which you mentioned at the start, which you welcome in those same figures, the 11,000 new people who've got jobs since the last figures were produced. Jackie Bailey. Do you know, I always welcome good news, but, but the thing that troubles me is the Cabinet Secretary only wants to talk about the small things that are good and doesn't recognise the overall picture. Because unless we recognise that overall picture, then we won't intervene appropriately to stop the economy falling into recession. It is that serious. The Bank of Scotland PMI published on Monday confirmed that the private sector in Scotland contracted in May. And whilst the difference from April to May may indeed be slight, it is a worrying sign of overall contraction in the Scottish economy. So I urge the government to bring a sharper, more urgent focus to their efforts to grow the economy. If we are to avoid some of the very legitimate concerns about a recession and unemployment increasingly becoming a reality. If they do so, they will have the full support of this side of the chamber. And of course, oil and gas are critically important sectors of our economy, an industry we all support with highly skilled workers that often work in challenging conditions. But there is no doubt that the oil crisis has had a devastating impact. Give way. Murder Fraser. Jackie Bailey for giving way. Seeing as you mentioned oil and gas and labour support, 
wonder if you could clarify for Ineos, who wrote to the Labour Party yesterday, seeking to draw attention to the confusion within the Labour Party. Her colleague Claudia Beamish suggests that the Labour Party are against fossil fuels. Jackie Bailey and their other colleagues are suggesting the Labour Party are in favour. When are they going to make up their minds? Um, I think you'll find there's no confusion on our part. I'm always happy to explain in words of one syllable um, to Murdo Fraser precisely what the Labour Party position is. We are in favour of a balanced energy mix. We do want to move to a low carbon economy. That's an aspiration I hope we all share for the future. But I have to say to you, you know, oil and gas are important to our economy. We recognise that. I don't think many of us in this chamber would have imagined that the price of a barrel of oil could have fallen from $115 in 2014 to $27 in January 2016, the lowest level in more than a decade. And whilst there has been a welcome, albeit partial, recovery in price, it is still less than half of previous levels, and that's expected to continue for at least five years more. In the face of that, I do welcome the improvements that the industry and the workforce together have made on increasing production and reducing operating expenditure. That drive for efficiency has reduced the unit cost of production by a staggering 28%. However, Oil & Gas UK do report that further cost reduction measures will be necessary. But let me sound a very clear note of caution here, because I've been contacted by an offshore worker on the construction side who's employed by one of the main contractors in the North Sea. He describes terms and conditions being eroded, workers being paid off, then brought back on zero hours contracts. And this can happen several times in the space of a few months. He tells me that a lot of his colleagues are walking away from the sector and are finding alternative jobs. The workload is increasing, morale is at rock bottom, and when things do pick back up, there will be a skill shortage because many have already let their tickets expire, having had, quite frankly, enough. He said, it is a sad day when zero hours contracts seem to be gripping the industry offshore. Many are concerned about health and safety, and I fear this loss of experience will take many years to put right. And he is, of course, right. If workers are treated in this way, they will move on their skills will be lost to the industry. And the industry bears responsibility for this and must stop these unfair practices. Because it is the human cost that is truly troubling. The impact on jobs is frankly breathtaking. Oil and Gas UK reported that jobs supported by the offshore industry will have fallen by the end of this year by 120,000. That's 120,000 individual people, never mind the wider impact on their families too. And the loss of jobs touches every part of Scotland, much of it increasingly focused on the northeast. The jobs lost, in a second, the jobs lost are those directly employed in extraction of oil and gas, the supply chain which is extensive, and of course the induced jobs created by the sector's spending in the wider economy. <coughs> the signs in the northeast are worrying. As you would expect, unemployment has risen, property sales are down, business startups have fallen, whilst in Scotland as a whole, they're actually increasing. And hotels have seen their yield per room fall by 42% due to lower occupancy rates. Again, this is at a time when there are increases elsewhere. I'll give way to the Minister. Paul Willows. Grateful to Jackie Bailey for giving way. Um, I just wanted to highlight, I, I don't decry the, the, the scale of the challenge we face, but I would just ask Jackie Bailey to reflect on the use of the 120,000, which is a UK-wide figure. It is not entirely, uh, the, the numbers are not affecting Scotland to that extent. Jackie Bailey. Um, you know, we can argue about whether it's 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. I think the Minister would do well to recognise the scale of this. And let me, let me acknowledge... Let me acknowledge the very positive work of Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeenshire Council in their efforts to support the industry and protect jobs. I also recognise the considerable efforts of Sir Ian Wood, firstly in identifying what needed to change in the Wood Review and who has chaired, I think it's called the North East One Group, to do everything possible to minimise the effects of the oil crisis on the industry and the local economy. Likewise, I welcome the work of the Scottish Government and in particular the Energy Task Force under the stewardship of Lena Wilson of Scottish Enterprise. But you know, with the scale of the challenge we face, I believe we have a responsibility to do much, much more and to do so urgently. We've set out Labour's proposals. I hope 
that some, if not all of them, will find favour with the Chamber. But I'm sure there'll be other suggestions that merit support. I am also conscious that some of the actions must rest with the UK Government, where they involve reserved matters like taxation. But that is not and should never be an excuse for us doing nothing. Let's use the powers we have. Let's strain every sinew to support the industry and protect jobs. And let's be honest, the industry itself equally has a responsibility to do more. In the short term, we support the calls from trade unions for an industry summit involving operators, regulators, government at all levels and the trade unions themselves. We've made no secret that we want the Scottish Government to publish an updated oil and gas bulletin because we need to assess the impact on the Scottish economy and importantly make sure the focus is on jobs. There should be an immediate review of the Scottish Government's 12 million transition training fund to ensure it's working effectively. Now, recent reports show that only 91 people had actually received assistance, but I see that figure has been updated by the Cabinet Secretary to 100. My understanding, though, is that one of the criteria is that someone needs to have secured another job first before they're eligible for the fund. If that's the case, I'm not surprised that numbers are small. And whilst I welcome John Swinney's announcement yesterday that this can be used to train teachers, we are talking about 20 vacant teaching posts, which will not in and of itself make a dent in the scale of the jobs lost. We believe that we need the Energy Task Force to have a much sharper focus too. The Cabinet Secretary's amendment talks about the task force having helped 8,800 people and 100 companies. In a PQ answered yesterday, just one hour earlier than his amendment was lodged, he said they'd help 2,000 500 people and 100 companies. Now that's a significant improvement in work rate in the space of an hour, which I commend, but you know, irrespective of which figure is right, you know, the really important thing that's missing, irrespective of the number, is that we should not simply focus on inputs, but rather we need to know about outcomes. How many jobs have actually been saved? Not the number of people you've seen, but how many jobs have been saved? How many people have the task force helped to find and sustain other employment? These are the things we should be measuring. Much harder to do, yes, absolutely, but these are the challenges we should set ourselves. Look, we're faced with a potential loss of 120,000 jobs by the end of this year, and we're not even beginning to touch 10% of that, never mind help people actually get other jobs. Let me touch briefly, I've given away loads of times and I'm running out of time. Let me touch briefly on some of the medium term actions. The SNP favour the creation of regional economic forums. We agree. Let's have one in the northeast involving trade unions, civic society, as well as public and commercial interests. We've previously called for the creation of a new public body, UK Oil, to help the industry with public investment in strategic infrastructure. And I would hope that the Scottish Government and other parties in the Parliament join us in lobbying the UK Government for that. We need a plan for the export market because the skills built up in the se sector are indeed world class and should lend themselves to new areas of exploration and therefore I welcome the recent Scottish enterprise led trip to Burma to do exactly that. I know that others in the chamber would urge us to make the transition to a low carbon economy and move away from an over-reliance on fossil fuels. But you know, in the short to medium term, we need to work to secure jobs in the North Sea. But we do need a plan for transferable jobs and skills. Technology and skills transfer into other subsea offshore technologies like renewable energy requires planning and coordination. And we do think that the Scottish Government should lead in this. In the medium to long term, we support investment in decommissioning. And I know the key question here is one of timing. We don't want to decommission too early, as this could be detrimental to the industry, but we should not let the opportunity pass us by. Presiding officer, in coming to a close, this week has seen a flurry of statistics and warnings from respected economists and commentators about the state of the Scottish economy. We were a hair's breadth away from recession last year. It might be unavoidable this year, but please, I implore the Scottish Government, don't bury your heads in the sand. Everything is not okay. Um, we need, quite clearly, intervention by the Government. The Fraser of Allender Institute said quite clearly, it's not new strategies the Scottish economy needs, but clear insights and policy action. 
I urge all parties in this chamber to come together to take urgent action on the economy and on oil and gas. I move the motion in my name. I call on Paul Wheelhouse to open for the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to update Parliament on the measures this government is taking to promote sustainable economic growth and to ensure that all communities in Scotland can benefit from the proceeds of this growth. The Scottish, government, uh, Scottish economy has been resilient over the past 12 months despite challenging conditions. Uh, GDP grew by 1.9% last year in line with our long-term average, while wages grew at their fastest rate in real terms since before the financial crisis. And today's labour market statistics do show overall unemployment uh, largely unchanged, actually down 4,000 on this time last year. So Ernst & Young's survey on foreign direct investment also indicated that 2015 was a record year for Scotland. 119 investment projects were secured last year, more than any other part of the UK outside of London, and helping to secure over 5,300 jobs across the country. The survey also highlighted that the Scottish economy has, and I quote, been resilient in managing to weather the oil and gas price volatility storm, whilst also being able to flourish in other sectors, unquote. And this month, both the Ernst & Young Item Club and the Fraser of Allender Institute forecast that the Scottish economy will continue growing this year and next, despite the challenging economic climate that we face. However, if I may develop my points further, and then I'll bring in Mr Macdonald. However, the reports also noted that the economy faces significant external economic headwinds. In particular, falling oil prices have presented significant challenges for the oil and gas sector. And this was confirmed by the employment analysis published last week by Oil and Gas UK. And I heard firsthand the challenges faced by the sector earlier this month when the Cabinet Secretary and I met with the industry leaders in Aberdeen to discuss what more can be done to support the sector. The Scottish Government is working closely with the industry, the workforce, uh, trade unions and the UK Government to secure a long-term future for the sector. And in February, we established, as Jackie Bailey mentioned, a £12 million transition training fund to support individuals and help the sector retain talent. At the same time, Scottish Enterprise allocated a further £12.5 million for oil and gas innovation and further business support. And just to clarify something that Jackie ba Bailey referred to in her opening remarks, the criteria have changed and there has been a, a, a more flexibility given in terms of the need to find a, a, a permanent job before uh, attaining the fund. And also we've seen since uh, the Cabinet Secretary and I uh, visited a significant change and increase. So it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's always growing the number of applications. I'll bring in Mr Macdonald. Thank you for taking the intervention. The Minister has mentioned a couple of times the estimates of jobs lost across the UK that were produced by Oil and Gas UK last week. Can he tell us, as the Minister with responsibility in this area, what is the Government's estimate of the number of jobs lost in Scotland as a result of the oil price downturn? Thank you, President Officer. I will get Mr Macdonald a, a more definitive figure, but I, read, I believe it's in the region of 50,000, just slightly over 50,000 that have been uh, felt in Scotland. That's clearly a very significant number. I'm not uh, in any way dismissing the scale of the challenge, but I just wanted to bring to attention of Ms Bailey that 120,000 is a UK-wide figure, not a Scotland-specific figure. But the Energy Jobs Task Force also continues to provide valuable support. It has engaged with approximately 8,800 individuals and over 100 employers to better help those affected move forward into new employment, new ventures, training, or education. And the North East is facing particular challenges. I acknowledge that. that. This is why, on top of the £125 million we contributed to the Aberdeen City Region deal, we have announced a further £254 million of support in key infrastructure to secure Aberdeen's position as one of the world's leading cities for business and industry, taking the Scottish Government total to £379 million compared to £125 million from the UK Government. And the Scottish Government has taken decisive steps to support the sector and the economy of North East Scotland and we are also pressing the UK Government to take further action to support the industry. It is crucial to incentivise investment and exploration to support what remains a vital and significant employer across Scotland and the UK and we will continue to engage constructively with the UK Government to take the action needed to protect jobs. The Scottish Government is also continuing to seek to diversify the energy sector and earlier today I'm pleased to say that I, I attended a multi-million pound uh, contract being signed between Global Energy Group and Siemens which will enable NIG Energy Park in Rosher to develop into a genuine multi-energy site, securing around 100 direct and indirect jobs and associated supply chain opportunities. And this contract is an important milestone for the port of NIG, which has received more than £45 million in investment since 2011 and is now well on its way to being recognised as one of Scotland's key energy ports. Presiding officer, our labour market has continued to grow in recent years. There are now nearly 2.6 million people in employment in Scotland, close to a record high and an increase of over 140,000 since 2010. 
However, the labour market statistics released today illustrate we cannot be complacent. I agree with Jackie Bailey on that, and that Scotland continues to face economic headwinds. And that's why this is uh, one of our first actions in this Parliament will be publication of a new labour market strategy uh, to ensure that everyone in Scotland has the skills and opportunities to gain well-paid and secure employment. We delivered more than 25,000 modern apprenticeships last year and are committed to providing 30,000 a year by 2020, helping to ensure that our young people have the skills and training they need to get into work, with 92% of modern apprenticeships completing an apprenticeship still in work six months later. And we will now work with uh, schools to inspire more young people into science, technology, engineering and mathematics to ensure they have the skills necessary to compete in the labour market. We're ensuring that those who are made unemployed get access to the training to help them back into employment. Such pre-employment skills training is essential both for those nearest the labour market and those who face barriers to employment. Over 50,000 training places have already been delivered through Employability Fund since its launch and a further 11,650 training places will be provided this year. And once we have the powers, we will introduce a jobs grant to help young people aged 16 to 24 who have been unemployed for six months or more back into work. We are also continuing to encourage fair work and progressive workplace practices through the Business Pledge, the promotion of the Living Wage and the Fair Work Convention, measures which not only protect workers' well-being but can also help to improve productivity. Presiding officer, a strong and vibrant economy is fundamental to increasing prosperity and reducing inequality, and that is why increasing the competitiveness of Scotland's economy has been a central feature of our economic strategies since 2007, and we have seen real progress. Since 2007, Scotland's productivity has grown faster than the UK as a whole. Our business base is growing with the number of registered businesses in Scotland at an all-time high, and we're attracting a record number of foreign investment projects in Scotland, so there is much to be positive about. However, we recognise that more needs to be done. That's why we're investing in our transport infrastructure, including the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, A9 Duelling, the M8 Extension, I'm pleased to see the Borders Railway in recent times, and the Glasgow to Edinburgh Rail Improvement Programme. And crucially, in the digital infrastructure that our economy needs to support future productivity growth. We're supporting investment in our cities. We've committed to invest £500 million over 20 years in the Glasgow City Region deal, a deal local leaders believe is capable of delivering 29,000 jobs across the region and attracting over £3.3 billion in private investment. We're encouraging a culture of innovation in Scotland through our network of innovation centres, our proposals for an annual innovation prize and innovation pilots being taken forward by the Can Do Innovation Forum, which both the Cabinet Secretary and I attended last week. And we'll continue to encourage Scottish firms to internationalise, building on the good work done by SDI in recent years. This will be supported by our end-to-end -end review of our enterprise development and skills agencies, led by the Cabinet Secretary, uh, which will ensure that they are well placed to deliver our shared ambitions on Scotland's productivity performance. And this morning, the Cabinet Secretary published the terms of reference for this review in a response to Jackie Bailey's parliamentary question on the remit of the review. The review and recommendations will focus on three main aims, achieving the Scottish Government's ambitions as set out in the Scottish Economic Strategy and National Performance Framework, ensuring our economic and skills intervention are shaped by users' needs, and ensuring that delivery continuously reflects best practice. And it's therefore important we enter into the review with an open mind to study the evidence and listen to users, to focus on improved outcomes throughout, and not to seek uh, to preempt the outcome in any way. In closing, presiding officer, growing our economy in a sustainable way is vital in increasing living standards, tackling inequality and providing the funding required to invest in world-class public services. This government will ensure that growing the economy and promoting inclusive growth will remain central to everything that we do, so we create a productive, competitive economy that supports sustainable, good quality employment for those live, who live and work here. Through our continued focus on inclusive growth, investment, innovation and internationalisation, we will secure a strong, resilient economy for all in Scotland. And I move the amendment in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Minister. I call Murdo Fraser to speak to move Amendment 448.1. Mr Fraser, seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, start by welcoming the opportunity this afternoon to debate the future of the Scottish economy? And one area where the Labour Party is right is to identify some of the concerns which currently face the economy in Scotland. Only two weeks ago in this chamber, I highlighted some of our concerns, pointing to recent data showing how certain sectors were struggling. And what is perhaps most concerning is the growing economic gap between our performance in Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. As Jackie Bailey pointed out, we have today new economic data, with the employment rate in Scotland now down below the UK average, and a warning, a stark warning from the Fraser of Allender Institute, a well-respected economic body, that Scotland's economy is flirting with recession. We heard on Monday that new output figures for the Scottish construction industry show activity in the private industrial sector fell over the 12 months to March 
2016 to its lowest level since 1988. And the Scottish Building Federation and the Scottish Property Federation, in response, highlighted the Scottish Government's changes to empty property rates relief for industrial property as a potential cause of the slump in output. Last year, the Scottish Conservatives warned that these changes, which would bring empty industrial property within the remit of business rates for the first time, would lead to a shrinkage in the supply of commercial and industrial premises available for let and halt the construction of speculative developments. It appears that these fears are already being realised. And what this illustrates is how the policies of the Scottish Government can have a detrimental impact on the opportunity for Scottish economic growth and Scotland's economic performance. And highlights once again our concern that Scotland's relative performance in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom is going backwards rather than forwards. Now, today's motion from Labour concentrates on the oil and gas industry and draws attention to the well understood decline in production and jobs as a result of the fall in the oil price. And I find very little in the Labour motion today with which I can disagree. It is, however, fair to say that it is not all bad news uh, within the sector, and I have some sympathy with the comments the Minister made in his opening remarks. Last week, the Bank of Scotland published the latest in its research series uh, into oil and gas. And while the report does conclude that last year has been an exceptionally challenging one for the industry, there was some optimism in the longer term. Interestingly, many smaller firms were adapting better to changing economic situations than larger firms, and a quarter of the overall firms surveyed told the bank that they had actually grown in employment numbers throughout uh, the downturn. To highlight just one example, Deputy Presiding Officer, Maryland ERD are based in my own constituency in Perth, and have been one of the success stories in oil and gas as an award-winning drilling energy consultancy. Only yesterday, Maryland ERD announced they had recruited four new members of staff to their team and have recently appointed a recruitment manager, which at a time of so many redundancies in the sector is certainly a vote of confidence in the future. Under the stewardship of Managing Director Ian Hutchison, Maryland have now won the Queen's Award for Enterprise for International Trade for two years in a row. That's good news for the company, good news uh, for Perth and the local economy, and an encouragement to the oil and gas industry more generally. Now, our amendment uh, to the motion this afternoon highlights two areas in particular. The first relates to the changes announced in the 2016 budget by the UK Government for the fiscal arrangements for oil and gas. These included the effective abolition of petroleum revenue tax, the reduction in the supplementary charge from 20% to 10%, and additional £20 million of funding for a second round of seismic surveys in 2016-17, an extension to the investment and cluster area allowances, and a range of other initiatives. And these are fiscal changes which have been warmly welcomed by the industry. And I can only imagine that this warmly welcomed support for the oil and gas sector somehow slipped Jackie Bailey's normally very generous mind when she was drafting her motion uh, for this afternoon. So I just wanted just to correct that by putting it in our amendment uh, for this afternoon's debate. Yes, of course. Secretary. Uh, can I thank Murdo Fraser for giving away? One thing which I think he admitted in that list was the commitment given at the budget to consider loan guarantees. Now, in my discussions with industry players, that is the preeminent ask that they have. Vitally important that they safeguard the infrastructure that's there. Would he join with me in the call I made to Greg Hans, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, to say there needs to be real pace? This can't wait two or three years. This has to happen very quickly. Murdo Fraser. Well, no, my colleague. Um, Alexander Burnett will say some more about this when he's, he's uh, winding up. But we did, uh, with a number of colleagues, meet the Chancellor uh, last week and discuss some of these issues. And uh, the, the Treasury are very much aware uh, that, uh, that uh, progress needs to be made. However, I think it, to say that, uh, as I think the Cabinet Secretary has done elsewhere, that Treasury have been dragging its feet is simply not a true characterisation of what's actually been happening. And I expect we will see some announcements uh, very shortly. I will just quote something we heard yesterday from Stephen Halliday, who's Group President uh, uh, the leading industry analyst, uh, Wood McKenzie, who said that the UK now has one of the best and simplest tax systems in the world for the sector, in the world, Cabinet Secretary. So I think we should combine in praising that. Now, the second part of our amendment relates to one of the findings in the Bank of Scotland report, which I referred to also in the Chamber last week. When it comes to opportunities from diversification, 52% of large companies have an interest in onshore shale gas. 
Now, undoubtedly, as we have argued in this chamber many times before, there are substantial opportunities to utilise the skills base in the oil and gas sector to develop a new industry and create thousands of jobs in onshore oil and gas. But sadly, these opportunities will not currently be found in Scotland due to the Scottish Government's moratorium. It has taken a deliberate policy position that is holding back opportunities for diversification and holding back the sector. If the Scottish Government wants to be taken seriously on its support for oil and gas, then it does need to think again on this issue and it needs to listen to the science. As I pointed out in the Chamber last week, last week, its own expert scientific report concluded that the technology exists to allow the safe extraction of such reserves subject to robust regulation being in place. They have had that report for nearly two years, Deputy Presiding Officer, they need to start acting upon it. Note, I have to say, that uh, Labour are any better. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, the Labour position when it comes to fossil fuels seems to be hopelessly confused, as Ineos pointed out in their letter to the party yesterday. Any state that Labour's stance on fracking implies that Scottish Labour is now against fossil fuel development in general, and it implies they are also opposed to further North Sea oil developments, flying in the face of everything we have heard from Jackie Bailey already this afternoon. Labour really need to make up their minds whether they are in favour of fossil fuels, as Jackie Bailey seems to be, or against, as Claudia Beamish seems to be. I'm presiding up. Members I, actually passed his last minute, I, so if he begin let, to let wind just, up, please. Let me just close, if I can, Deputy Citing Officer, because it's not just me who thinks the Labour Party have lost the plot, because only at the weekend, Gary Smith, Scottish Secretary of the GMB, said of Scottish Labour, it is a party which is arrogant, doesn't consult with us, and is completely out of touch with the concerns of many of our members. And he went on to say it's a party that is divided, afraid, no, a afraid. party that seems intent on self-harming, a party that lacks discipline, and a party fundamentally that doesn't know what it stands for. Condemned by their own comrades, Deputy Presiding End Officer, of quote, I have pleasure speech, in moving please. the amendment in my name. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I remind members who haven't pressed the request to speak buttons to do so now? I call Ivan McKee, Ivan McKee to be followed by Finlay Carson. That will fin Finlay Carson's first speech. Uh, Mr McKee, six minutes or thereabouts, please. And thereabouts means less, not more. Of course. Thank you, President Officer. Um, a key measure of the strength of a business is how it responds in times of adversity. And the same is true of an economy. When global headwinds gust, the resilient get results. Governments work with industry, building on the inherent strengths of a diverse economy, taking advantage of opportunities and positioning itself for cyclical upturn. Recent years have seen challenging times for Scotland's oil and gas sector. Twin impacts of a dramatic fall in the price of oil, driven by global political events outside the control of anyone in this chamber, and the inability of the UK government to understand, never mind work with the sector, to ensure that its long-term contribution to the Scottish economy is maximised. There are, however, recent hopeful signs that this is beginning to, un to be understood, uh, even the highest levels in Westminster, as the next ex-Prime Minister of the UK clearly stated on Sunday in the context of a different referendum explaining why Norway was so wealthy. He said, well, they have as much oil as we do and they've only got five million people. Well, Mr Cameron, they've got something else too. They've got a government that has control of their own natural resources and knows how best to manage them for the long-term success of the sector and their national economy. Scotland's oil and gas industry is one of the many sectors that underpins the Scottish economy, but it's not by a long way our only sector, and it's not the one I'm going to primarily focus on today. The record of the Scottish Government in working with and supporting the offshore sector or protecting its skills base will be more than adequately covered by my North East colleagues Gillian Martin and Stuart Stevenson. What I'm going to talk today about, presiding officer, is attractiveness how economies attract international business in an increasingly interconnected world. My own experience making big decisions over many years on where businesses should invest has helped me understand attractiveness, and Ernst & Young understand it too. The EY Attractiveness Survey shows Scotland attracting more foreign direct investment projects than any part of the UK outside London last year, a 50 per cent increase on the previous year. The survey stated that Scotland has been resilient in managing to weather the oil and gas price volatility storm, while also being able to flourish in other sectors. And let's have a look at some of those other sectors. The survey highlights business services, software, scientific research and food sectors offering strength and diversity for Scotland. 
our food and drink sector, the heritage and global brand recognition of our whisky industry, together with premium quality food brands that Scotland is recognised for, going from strength to strength. Business services, a sector I am familiar with, exporting Scottish expertise, generating income for the Scottish economy. Scientific research, underpinned by a great university sector, and R&D performance, something I shall talk about more later on. In Scottish manufacturing, described in the EY Item Club update as being set to match or outperform its UK counterpart. Because the truth is, presiding officer, as the EY survey so clearly states, Scotland's economy has proven resilient in the face of considerable challenges. And that hasn't happened by accident. The Scottish Government isn't just talking the talk, it's most definitely walking the walk. With a clear focus on internationalisation, a global Scotland trade and investment strategy, a 36% 30 increase in the value of exports since 2007, a trebling of the number of export advisors, new investment hubs in London and Brussels to go with the one in Dublin. An SNP government encouraging a culture of innovation through a network of innovation centres, the Innovation Prize and the work of the Can Do Innovation Forum. The sectoral manufacturing action plans working with industry to drive continuous improvement and identify growth opportunities. And a strong performance in research and development, again quoting from the EY survey, Equally positive for Scotland's skill base is its impressive showing in R&D projects. A 44% increase in real terms R&D expenditure between 2007 and 2014, compared to a 10% increase in the UK over the same period. Higher education R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP highest in the UK and fourth highest in the OECD. And not just R&D, look let's look at investment in infrastructure. Five billion investment in rail improvements, 3.6 billion upgrading water and sewage infrastructure, 1.4 billion upgrading the road network, 3 billion to build 50,000 more affordable homes and 400 million to deliver 100% super priced broadband across the country. This SNP government investing in businesses, expanding the small business bonus scheme and lifting at 100,000 businesses out of rates completely and investing in people, increasing the number of modern apprenticeships from 15,000 to 25,000 and then to 30,000. Introducing the jobs grant to support young people into work, almost doubling the level of free childcare to 1,140 hours. Because above all, this SNP government understands that by investing in our people, we can move Scotland's economy forward to realise more of its potential, focusing on building on the resilient base of our strong and varied economic sectors to take great advantage of future opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Carson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is an enormous privilege to be delivering my maiden speech in the Chamber today. And as is customary on occasions like this, I wish to pay tribute to my predecessor, the Right Honourable, Honourable Alec Ferguson. But first, I'm sure the whole chamber would like to join with me in congratulating him on receiving a knighthood in the Queen's birthday honours list. <laughs> Alec was first elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and has served with distinction for 17 years, most recently as the MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Four of those years were spent as the presiding officer of this parliament, and Alec was immensely proud when his fellow MSPs elected him into that role. And I wish Alec and Mirren a long and happy retirement. Presiding officer, there can be no greater honour for a Galavidian than to be given the opportunity to represent the place I call home, the place where I've lived and worked all my life. I'd like to thank the voters of Galloway and Western Freeze who placed their trust in me and gave me this opportunity. And as one of the last, if not the last, newbie MSPs, I can have the last word and tell you that my constituency is the most beautiful of all. <laughs> Galloway and the Solway Coast is often referred to as the Scottish Riviera and stretches from Scotland's most southerly point at the Muller Galloway to the winding River Niff in the east. It is as big as it is diverse. In the heart of the constituency lies Britain's largest forest park, offering spectacular views and encompassing the UK's first uh, dark sky project, where the inky black skies allow you to explore a world far beyond our own. The Solway Coast, a designated area of outstanding natural beauty with rugged coastline, sandy beaches and hidden coves. If there was ever an area of Scotland crying out for national park status, this is it. Land of dark, darkly rolling, rolling the land of silvery winding cree, 
Kiss by Solway's foamy sea, Bonnie Galawa. In Bonnie Galawa, there's something for everyone, whether it be Loch Ryan, the home of the only wild native oyster beds left in the UK, and I'm looking forward to supporting the first oyster festival, or lagging outdoor boasting one of Europe's longest zip wires, or a visit to one of the many historic abbeys castles across the region. You're sure to be in awe of the natural beauty, hidden gems and historical importance of this great but often forgotten corner of Scotland. Apart from many of the many rural communities like my home village of Twynham, my constituency can boast to being home to Scotland's national book town in Wigton and our artist town in Kukubri, which will hopefully soon have an art gallery of national significance, which will contain our Viking hoard, which is of international importance. Our small independent retailers in Castle Douglas punch well above their weight and buck the trend when it comes to high street decline, promoting the vibrant food and drink industry that exists in Dumfries and Galloway. I must also mention that Castle Douglas will soon host the Tour of Britain for the third time, a record only surpassed by London. Presiding officer, let me turn to the debate in hand. As we've heard today, the Scottish economy still faces a, lar a large number of challenges. In Galloway, the backbone of our economy is the small and medium-sized businesses. Their social impact to the well-being of local communities must never be underplayed. These businesses require a different level and a different kind of support, not a one-size-fits-all approach. That's why the Scottish Conservatives have called for a South of Scotland enterprise company, similar in form to the Highlands and Islands enterprise, which is a social as well as an economic remit. Such organisations would work with business, third sector organisations and local communities to identify the many problems that are unique to the south of Scotland and come up with tailored solutions to help drive the economy forward. Supporting existing businesses, upskilling our workforce, creating new jobs and improving the people's way of life. This is something which, that should be welcomed across the political spectrum and I encourage the Scottish Government to look at this seriously. As with all issues raised with me, internet connectivity is currently the most pressing and most important. For businesses to thrive, and they need to have access to high-speed broadband and a reliable mobile phone uh, network. In 2016, it's simply unacceptable that some communities in Galloway still don't have a mobile phone signal and experience only limited access to low-speed broadband, never mind high-speed. And on to transport. Given its strategic importance, I still question why the A75, a vital Euro route linking Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, has still not been dueled. Although some progress has been made, it's imperative that the next step includes a bypass for Spring Home and Crockett Ford. Let me turn to Stranraer. Only last week, a number of constituents were made redundant, maybe not significant on a national basis, but very significant on a rural basis. The transitional fund, uh, training fund mentioned previously gives employees in the oil and gas sector the opportunity to retrain as teachers with employment guarantees. And I call on the Scottish Government to offer my constituents the same level of assistance through tailored, targeted support. Such schemes should not be limited to one sector or one region. And a call for an enterprise zone for Sonar with prefer preferential business rates, accelerated planning and processes to pump prime and kickstart a town with huge potential. Since the relocation of ferry services from Stranraer to Cairn Ryan in 2011, the town has been crying out for support for this government and has too often been let down. During the election, the Deputy First Minister visited and pledged £6 million for the regeneration of the East Pier. I trust that these are not empty words. I hope that we will see the benefit of this money in the very near future. Presiding officer, the problem in Dumfries and Galloway are not unique but they are compounded by the realities of living and working in a rural region of Scotland. I am ambitious for the people of Galloway and Western Fries because we Gallivarians always are, but we need the support we deserve to turn these ambitions into reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I must reprimand you for failing to mention Old Mini Gaff, where I once lived with the River Cree at the bottom of my garden, so I put it on the record for you. I now call Gillian Martin to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Ms Martin. Thank you, President Officer. As the member for Aberdeenshire East, it's no surprise that I'd like to talk about the challenges facing the economy in the northeast of Scotland. It's uh, often the oil and gas service industries that keenly and most immediately feel the effects of any activity in oil and gas exploration and production sector. 
which we all know has been recently adversely affected by the geopolitical situation that has meant a reduction in the global oil price. And of course, the hospitality sector is also similarly affected. So I welcome the investment the Scottish Government has put into the city region deal and the additional 254 million to be invested in the North East infrastructure. I also welcome the Minister's statements today and the visits that he and Keith Brown have already made to Aberdeen so soon into their tenure, further evidence of the Scottish Government prioritising support to my area. Of course, what would make the biggest impact on the oil and gas sector is something that is out with the Scottish Government's control, and that's the adjustments to the tax system. I recognise some of the improvements were made in the recent UK budget, but more needs to be done. In particular, action on removing the fiscal barriers for enhanced oil recovery would greatly assist oil and gas production companies investing in the North Sea and, in particular, the North Atlantic area west of Shetland. Additionally, there's a disparity between the tax rebate rates for onshore oil and gas recovery versus offshore rates, a difference of around 12.5%. This doesn't make sense and should be, I think, revised immediately. I also point to my Westminster colleague Callum McCaig's call for action on loan guarantees, as has been mentioned already today, for the oil and gas sector. And the, this access to loans will boost innovation and it must be said, given that oil and gas has historically been a huge contributor to the UK Treasury, it's only right the industry gets this assistance in a time of need in order to maintain it for the future. I would urge the Conservative members to use whatever influence they have on their Westminster counterparts to take urgent action on this and get these guarantees in place as soon as possible. Well, what is clear but is that the North East must diversify as we look to the future. And that's why it's been utterly disappointing that the focus on the North East being a centre for innovation in renewable energy has had the rug pulled under it by wind farm subsidies being removed from the UK government, which is also having an impact on the many farmers who have invested in wind turbines, some of which are in this chamber. The job loss figures cited in the motion are troubling. But someone that I brought up in the North East whose family, friends and neighbours are involved in the industry, I know many have been directly affected. Um, it's a worrying time for many who have had relative employment security for many years. But I am heartened by how many people I know who've lost their jobs and who have turned their situation around. May figures uh, confirm that my constituency of Aberdeen Chile still has 84.8% employment, which is the third highest in Scotland behind Shetland and Orkney. And this confirms what I already know about the people in the North East, is that they are adaptable and resilient. And I want to give you some local examples from my constituency. Neil Bailey was told on his 50th birthday by Halliburton after 25 years of service that his job was no longer there for him. Initially devastated, as you would expect, Neil quickly decided to turn this into an opportunity for a career change that he's always had in the back of his mind. And he's now a support worker for adults with learning disabilities at Inspire and Inverurie. And then there's Drew Bremner, a consultant whose phone just stopped ringing after years of constant work offers. Drew got together with his friend Lee, who'd also just been made redundant from an oil and gas production company, and the two of them are set to open their drone survey business this month. And the phone has already been ringing. Traditionally, the North East labour market has been tight. We have and we still have issues recruiting public sector workers as a result of the North East being a particularly high wage economy for the last 40, 40 years. And I'm encouraged that so many people in oil and gas are recognising that they have transferable skills that will be a huge asset to our public sector. In addition, their infrastructure investment is also providing jobs, and I point to the AWPR project, which is also recruiting from those affected by job losses in the oil and gas. But a, new, a low oil price isn't new to us. Uh, this year has been particularly difficult, make no mistake. But we have bounced back before. And in the mid to late 90s, the industry was facing a price of $14 a barrel. And the industry has good form in adapting to cope with the highs and lows. Back then, large assets were sold by the oil and gas majors to smaller companies with smaller overheads. And personnel moved and upskilled and diversified. One thing that a lot of people don't realise is that a very large proportion of livelihoods in oil and gas are as, as a result of contract work. And those working in the sector are very used to coming to the end of the life of one project and then moving on to another. 
But what we must ensure is that if we do not lose this skilled workforce, if they move elsewhere for work. There are still huge opportunities in oil and gas, and I point to the Lag and Tormor operation in the west of Shetland as an example of this. We're already prioritising how we can ensure the sector retains its world-class workforce, supporting high-quality training and enabling redeployment and reskilling, but also, and most crucially, harnessing those skills for other areas which will lead to a more diverse economy in the area to take us into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. As Jackie Bailey said in introducing this debate, the latest estimate of job losses published last week by Oil and Gas UK is that 120,000 jobs will be lost by the end of the year. As the Minister has confirmed, over 50,000 of those lost jobs are here in Scotland and many, uh, of course, of those are in the North East, uh, as Gillian Martin and others have said. Many, indeed, people I know well. And last month's oil and gas survey from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce found that staff jobs in oil companies had fallen by 15% over the previous year and that a further 17% cut is predicted for the following 12 months. Each of those percentage points represents hundreds of jobs in and around Aberdeen as well uh, as jobs offshore and further afield. And the scale of future job losses is borne out by the Bank of Scotland research which was cited by Murdo Fraser. That reports that nearly two-thirds of Scottish firms in the oil and gas sector have made workers redundant in the last year, and that one-third expect to make more people redundant in the next year. And while it is true that some companies uh, have done relatively well, it is important to note that for every one job created last year, a further six jobs were lost. Minister. Intervention. I just want to highlight uh, the same report, I believe, showed that 22% of employers were prote uh, predicting they were going to take on employ employees this year as well. So just to get balance. Lewis MacDonald. That's absolutely right. And it's important to get balance. And, and, and I think the point I've made retrospectively from those figures that six times as many jobs have gone as has have been created, I fear, uh, may be reflected in what happens in the next few months. But that, of course, uh, is not simply a matter over which we have no control. It is a matter uh, where government can make a difference. But there is no uh, consensus around the suggestion in the government's amendment that things will look up as the negative impact of the oil price fades in 2017. For example, when the Bank of Scotland asked operators and contractors when they expected the price of Brent crude to recover to $75 to a level at which they could make profit, most companies said not before 2018, and most of the large companies which operate globally said 2020 or beyond. So lower for longer is the watchword of the oil and gas industry today. Industry is seeking to adapt to that. The workforce is deeply affected by that. It is critical uh, that government uh, takes that on board as well. The last thing the North East needs is complacency from government at any level. And the first thing we need here is for the Scottish Government to acknowledge the scale of the challenge and that responsibility for the stewardship of the Scottish economy lies here with Scottish Ministers. And I'm glad that we heard today for the first time a Minister acknowledge that tens of thousands of jobs have been lost as a consequence of the oil price downturn. I hope that is a sign of a change attack uh, from the Scottish Government, and if so, it is to be welcomed. But of course, it's not only oil jobs which have been lost in the northeast, or even jobs in the service industries which de depend indirectly on the price of oil. Hundreds of fish processing jobs have also been lost in recent months with a very substantial downscaling of the young seafood factory in Fraserburgh. And now nearly 100 jobs are set to go after Muller Wiseman confirmed that they will close their dairy at Tullus in Aberdeen, a decision which also has serious implications for dairy farmers in the northeast. Both of those companies will argue that they are creating other jobs elsewhere, but more fish filleters in Grimsby or a dairy expanding in Bells Hill will not compensate for the loss of jobs in North East Scotland, nor will Sainsbury's buying salmon from Marine Harvest in Rosyth. The challenge for North East Scotland is the same, whether we are talking about employment in the energy industries, in the food and drink sector, or indeed in the public sector. It is how to secure and sustain investment, jobs and growth within the region, despite being seen as remote from the largest markets and from the centres of political power. We need government at every level to meet that challenge by recognising just how serious it is and by making the policy decisions that will deliver public investment and attract private investment to the region. 
I welcome Aberdeen City Council's decision to call a second oil summit at the end of this month. Last year's summit allowed progress to be made towards an Aberdeen City region deal. And modest though that was, the city deal has at least acknowledged on the part of both the Scottish and the UK governments that investment in the infrastructure of the North East is in the public interest and that public investment can help secure private investment in the future. So I hope ministers from both governments uh, will be in Aberdeen on the 30th of June to consider what more they can do to bring investment into the city and region to secure future jobs. Holding jobs fairs for those who have been made redundant, as has happened, is important, but on its own it is not enough. We need Scottish enterprise and skills development Scotland to act with the urgency and the vigour that the situation demands, and we need Scottish Government to provide the resources which match the scale of the challenge. A £12 million, fund, uh, 12 million pound fund, which is open only to workers who already have a new employer to sponsor them, does not go nearly far enough. And I look forward to hearing more uh, about the increased flexibility which the Minister uh, promised earlier this afternoon. And supporting up to 20 redundant oil workers to train, retrain as teachers is also welcome, but is also not enough given the scale of both teacher shortages and oil and gas redundancies in the North East. Ultimately, we need ministers to recognise that it is their job to enable service companies in the Scottish supply chain to diversify into renewable energy, to compete for decommissioning work whenever that arises, and to protect jobs, because future jobs and growth matter to all of Scotland, and they are under real threat today. I hope all parties will respond to that by getting behind the Labour motion later this afternoon. Thank you very much. Paul Patrick Harvey, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate. Jackie Bailey began by making some general comments about the state of the Scottish economy, and I'd like to respond to those before coming on to the specific agenda facing oil and gas. Jackie Bailey made the case that a strong economy and a strong society are two sides of the same coin. We can't have one without the other, she said. I would agree that there is a deep connection between a strong economy and a strong society, but it's a more complex one than Jackie Bailey suggests. It is entirely possible to have a strong economy without a strong society because we've been there already. We know this to be true. There have been long periods of sustained, strong economic growth which have continued to see growing social inequality. Measuring the success, the health of our economy in GDP terms alone makes it very, very clear that we can see periods of sustained GDP growth and rising inequality. This has been part of the criticism of green economics uh, for decades. And it's a, a, a criticism which many economists around the world take to heart. They acknowledge that GDP has been placed on an economic pedestal it was never designed to occupy, and that whether or not we believe GDP growth on the planet of finite resources we inhabit can last forever, it is clearly inadequate to the task of measuring a strong, secure, sustainable and lasting economy, one which underpins the strong society that I believe most of us want to see built. And so if we want to see a fuller picture, a more balanced and nuanced picture of the health of the Scottish economy, I would urge the Scottish Government to continue to develop the National Performance Framework from its starting point into what I think it could become, a stronger replacement, a more diverse replacement, a more broad set of economic indicators. At present, it still has GDP at the pinnacle of the framework, a place that it doesn't deserve to occupy. Uh, a simplistic metric uh, which uh, di distracts us from the wider aspects of whether we have, in fact, a healthy economy supporting a strong society. There are reasons why uh, Greens will be unable, I'm afraid, to support either the motion or any of the amendments tonight. We did offer our own amendment, sadly not selected for debate. But I'd like to uh, refer to the question which Murdo Fraser put to, to Jackie Bailey. An uncharacteristically fair question, I thought, uh, from Murdo Fraser, uh, about the tension which exists between the two aspects of Labour's fossil fuel policy. And Jackie Bailey said, we do want to see a move toward a low-carbon economy. And within just a few seconds, said oil and gas are important to the Scottish economy. Both of these statements in, a, in isolation might well be true. 
but I hope that I, I can, if I can put it this mildly, Jackie Bailey might at least agree that there is a difficult tension between these two arguments. One which I think none of, neither the motion nor any of the amendments uh, adequately captures. There are three aspects to the transition which is required. Firstly, we are too dependent as an economy on the operation of oil and gas extraction and the jobs which are dependent on that activity. Secondly, are we too dependent on the consumption, not just of, of fossil fuels, of hydrocarbon as fuels, but as other aspects of our industrial uh, reliance upon them. The derivatives are in pretty much every aspect of, the, of our daily lives. And thirdly, and thirdly, we are too overexposed to an industry which is profoundly overvalued, valued as though all of its reserves will be turned into economic value. It is an overexposed industry. It is, in fact, a, a bubble. And un unless we address all three of these, we won't have a transition plan worthy of the phrase. Mike Rumbles. Do note the comments the member has just made about the North Sea industry, but he hasn't mentioned, uh, does he have any comments to make about the 50,000 people throughout Scotland who've lost their jobs yeah. based on the North East? Patrick In Harvey. Indeed we do, and I'm surprised that the member doesn't know that we've been producing work from the Scottish Greens for well over a year on the specific measures that can be taken in the short term to support people who are directly affected. And Jackie Bailey was right to set out the immediate impact on many of the people who are already being directly affected. But in the face of that reality, in the face of that reality, surely the least responsible course of action is to keep kidding ourselves on that business as usual will just bounce back, throw them another tax break and everything will be fine. Well, everything will not be fine with that agenda. Jackie Bailey's motion ends by calling uh, on us all to support the industry over the short, medium and long term. And this is the central challenge. This is the tension which is there in the Labour motion but not acknowledged explicitly. The challenge of supporting the people directly affected by the short term impact on this industry has to be done in the context of acknowledging that this industry isn't a long term proposition. Unless we address all three of these aspects, our reliance on the jobs coming from extraction, our ex overexposure to the carbon bubble, and Paul Wheelhouse has the distinction of being the only Scottish Government Minister who has acknowledged, when he was the Climate Change Minister, that the arguments around the carbon bubble are real and that the bulk of our fossil fuels cannot be used, cannot be burned around the world. Well, that was before the Paris Agreement, uh, and if he was meaningful, m meaning what he said then, then very clearly an even smaller proportion of their fossil fuel reserves can be used. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is the case for economic and industrial planning. Can we really kid ourselves on that the change is not upon us already? If we acknowledge that it is, can we really hope to see that readiness for that change simply emerge? When we see the future coming at us, are we really satisfied with last-minute task forces and emergency measures when we see specific jobs destroyed? I don't think we should be satisfied with that. Surely we must plan for the profound changes that are coming upon us uh, and to ensure that all people have the opportunity for a healthy society as well as a strong economy for the long term. Uh, thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Tabby Scott. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As uh, Ivan McKee adumbrated, I shall indeed uh, talk about the effect uh, uh, of the oil industry's difficulties on the North East. But I want to respond uh, to just a couple of points before I do so. Uh, Murdo Fraser, in particular, should be more cautious in praising the brevity and conciseness of the UK uh, tax code. The UK government itself reports uh, that from it being 759 pages in 1965-6 tax year, it is now 11,520 pages, and indeed the legislation upon which it is founded constitutes 2,413 pages. That is substantially more than many other places. I recognise Mr uh, Fraser correctly quoted but he needs a wider context. Um, and to Jackie Bailey, and she should listen up because this is unusual, I found her analysis more focused 
and more relevant to the debate than I often do, although I am, of course, going to disagree with some of the conclusions she draws uh, from it. But I do encourage her uh, to, to live up to the improvement in her contribution that we've had today. Now, for my constituents in Bamshire and Bucking Coast, home to the world's biggest offshore oil support base at uh, Peterhead, and with many of my constituents working offshore uh, in our own waters, but also taking their expertise to the many corners of the world, to South America, to the Philippines, to the Horn of Africa, uh, where there are oil exploration. And that goes to the heart of a very important thing about the industry in the Northeast and in my constituency, that we have skills that have been built up over a long time that will sustain us over the long term if we have the opportunity to do so. And being denied the opportunity to take those skills to the new renewable energies, uh, energy uh, industries that we had expected, many of which would be offshore, where there would have been a particular relevance to the skills for the engineers and people who work offshore in the oil and gas industry, uh, is a particularly hurtful blow to the future economic and personal prospects uh, of the Northeast. Now, I disagree with Patrick. He said this is an industry without a long-term future. Could the member use the full name of other members, please, just for the OR? Thanks. I do apologise. I'm not sure what I said. Patrick Harvey, if I didn't say Mr Harvey. Um, industry is, is, in fact, a long-term proposition, not, as he says, a short-term proposition. But, presiding officer, it may not be as fuel. We can solve the issue of using oil and gas as fuel. We've yet to make a big impression in the use of oil and gas as chemical feedstock. So it will remain an important part of an industrial environment, even as we move away from using oil and gas as fuel. I, yes, I will. Briefly, Patrick please. Harvey. The member makes a serious point to which I did acknowledge there's a, there's a place in this argument. But does he really think, given the impact that's happening on investment in the North Sea at the moment, that if this material, hydrocarbons, was only be, being able to use for non-fuel chemical feedstocks and not for fuel, does he think any of it would be economically viable as an investment? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, Mr Harvey is clearly listening to a different speech from the one that I gave because, of course, I did not say that. But I point to the long-term future because Mr Harvey said there was none. I suggest that there is a long-term future. Um, a third of our oil remains, and that's only of the stocks that we find. We know that uh, we're still finding oil uh, in our sector. The Norwegians are finding oil, for example, in the Johans Ferdrup field uh, relatively recently. So opportunities will continue to be there. There will be opportunities for investment. And we see the successes of, of smaller companies uh, that various people have referred to. But I want to just say a word or two about fracking, which is the last part of the Conservative uh, motion, and why it is right that we have a moratorium on the subject. And I want to reference the United States experience, because they have quite a lot uh, of it. The National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety in the United States um, talks about workers being regularly exposed to high levels of benzene, which is a known carcinogen. The, I've no longer got time, do forgive me. Uh, they also talk about uh, exposure to silicosis, a deadly lung disease, uh, which is an issue. The British Medical Journal uh, talks about volatile organic compounds and diesel particulate matter uh, that is reported by the US Environmental Protection Agency. And an academic paper uh, published in New Solutions uh, talks about health conditions uh, that have become worse after shale gas development started in the area. Uh, participants in that survey reported worsening existing conditions and new conditions, not simply in human beings, but in animals and household pets. And the Environmental Protection Agency itself in the United States reports there is uncertainty about 
out uh, how many incidents there are, but in Colorado, it can be as much as 12.2 spills for every 100 wells, with all the consequences that flow from that. And that uh, they identify as reaching surface water in 9% of cases, but contaminating soil in 64% of cases. They also identify that not everything is known, and I accept that. That is why a moratorium is right, why we uh, should look further at the research uh, to underpin a long-term decision. We cannot proceed with uh, shale in the present circumstances. The US experience tells us that. But oil and gas in the Northeast certainly needs support. But more importantly, we need renewables to become the focus. And the UK government is letting the people in my area, in the North East of Scotland, very seriously down in that regard. Thank you. Members will appreciate I'm giving members to take interventions a little extra time in fairness to encourage interventions. That's not necessarily that people should intervene in you, Mr Scott. Call Tavi Scott to be followed by John Mason. Deputy Presiding Officer, you often intervened on me, but that was in a, in a previous life uh, long before, long, many years ago. Um, let me start, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, by uh, agreeing with Stuart Stevenson that oil and gas uh, in the North Sea and indeed west of Shetland and indeed in many other parts of the globe is not just uh, an industry now, but it's a long term uh, industry. I, I profoundly disagree with uh, Patrick Harvey, not least of which because he used a phrase that it was business as usual. Well, de demonstrably, the oil and gas industry is not going through a period of business as usual because, as the Minister sadly confirmed 50,000 people have lost their jobs in Scotland alone, 120,000 across the UK. And I suspect we don't know the true scale of what's uh, actually going on in terms of the changes uh, in the industry uh, on employment. Uh, so it uh, will be a long-term industry. It'll be a very different industry in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, or indeed 40 years' time. But I don't doubt for a minute that it will still exist. For this, if no other reason, when... Um, the chairman and chief executive of the Total company was in Shetland back in uh, the early part of May opening the Total at Lag and Tormor field. He talked to an audience uh, of oil people and indeed to uh, the press, both national and local, about the long-term uh, interests of his company. And what he described wasn't just about oil and gas, and they are a very large player in worldwide terms uh, on oil and gas in many different theatres of operation, but about becoming uh, an energy company who, yes, would be uh, investing very heavily in renewables, very heavily in different forms of energy uh, over a long period of time. Uh, so he's an oil executive to his fingertips. He's, a, he's a, an absolute... Uh, oil man as you define it, uh, but he saw the way in which the industry is changing and I suspect he will be at the forefront of the way in which the industry will change. So it's not business as usual, that's just a simplistic way to put it. It's a very different kind of industry now than it was even two uh, years ago. I also think on a day like this, as we should very briefly even just reflect that uh, just the week before uh, we all faced the electorate, um, a lot of um, people lost their lives on a super puma that crashed uh, just off the coast of Norway in Bergen uh, on the 29th of April. And just as recently as 2013, four people lost their lives uh, when a super puma crashed off Sombra in my uh, constituency. This is an industry that pays one heck of a heavy price, the ultimate price. Uh, to bring home uh, a resource which uh, we all, well, most of us, uh, do depend in everyday uh, life. Uh, there are some big changes uh, happening. Uh, the change in oil prices was rightly mentioned by uh, the front bench of all the parties and the changes that will go on there from 110 to as low as $29 a barrel uh, and today around $48 a barrel. From Costs of the industry being cut by 20% in the North Sea, with many industry analysts saying that unless it falls by 40%, the North Sea will not be internationally competitive, which can only mean one thing for uh, the people who work uh, across Scotland. There are 800 supplier businesses in the UK who work uh, on oil and gas contracts, but 600 of them are in Scotland, and the great majority are in the northeast uh, of Scotland. Uh, the northeast is the oil and gas industry. I sometimes think um, the rest of Scotland is somewhat isolated uh, from that. Jack he really made a series of important points about the wider economy, uh, and uh, I agreed with much of what she uh, ar argued. But because of the investment in construction, some of it rightly done by the Scottish Government, but others because of the private sector investment in construction, uh, a lot of what's been happening in the economy has been masked uh, by uh, that uh, investment. And if we were um, just dependent on the oil and gas sector, then I suspect what's been going on in the North East would be even more stark in terms of the wider economic figures for the country uh, as a whole. But there are two points uh, of uh, importance in terms of, of the future opportunities. One was mentioned by others, and that is 
the West of Shetland uh, developments. Lagan Tomor is actually the biggest civil engineering contract uh, in the UK since the Olympics. The Clare Ridge developments that BP are investing in literally at this moment because some of the infrastructure is being put offshore uh, this month uh, is, uh, just will in a minute, uh, is vitally important uh, for uh, that future. Uh, and uh, it will go on. The West of Shetland developments will go on because at $50 a barrel, it still looks uh, remarkably difficult. But as oil prices rise, and they will, that's the point that uh, uh, we don't know when, but as they will, uh, then some of those developments will look more attractive uh, for the future. I suppose I should give way to Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. And, and I feel uh, somewhat bewildered that I'm standing here about to ask the same question that Murdo Fraser asked to Jackie Bailey. Because I've heard Willie Rennie, for example, on many occasions saying that the reason the Liberal Democrats don't support fracking is they don't want to open up a new front on fossil fuels. Why are you applying that policy only onshore and not offshore? Scott. I'm going to talk about the oil and gas industry. It seems to me that um, Mr Fraser and others have had a very lively, endless, if I may say so, debate about uh, fracking. Um, Patrick Harvey uh, didn't mention fracking in his speech and now chooses to mention it uh, later in the debate. That's uh, a matter totally for him. Much of it is lost on me. Um, can I uh, finally deal with a couple of points about the Sulinvo uh, oil terminal uh, and Lerwick? Lerwick is a, a port that will be part of the decommissioning future. That is a 40 to 60 billion pound industry over the next 40 years. That's not Patrick Harvey business as usual. It's the changing nature of the industry. And the important point I want to make to the government front bench here uh, and to my uh, friends in the Conservative Party is uh, let us make sure that when we, the taxpayer in this country, provide tax relief for that decommissioning, uh, those jobs uh, remain here yeah, in Scotland yeah, yeah. or across the UK. Yeah, yeah. The Brent uh, fields, the three huge jackets that are being decommissioned from the Brent field will go to Teesside. I want to see some of that work in Shetland in the future and indeed in other parts of Scotland, but it's uh, vitally important that ports like Lerwick are centres of that uh, for the future. And the final point is to uh, make sure that on the skills agenda that Jackie Bailey and others mentioned, it's not just jobs in the, in the North East or in other parts of Scotland, but it's also facilities like the diving school in Loch Linney, which trains uh, divers and has done for many, many years. It is an essential part of, our, our, of the skills infrastructure that we need in Scotland, uh, and long may that be the case. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. Call John Mason to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Mason. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The economy is clearly a very wide topic, and I'm looking forward to being on the Economic Committee as the Deputy Convener and looking in more depth at different sectors in this coming session. The Labour motion mentions two particular reports, namely by the Bank of Scotland and Ernst & Young, and I want to focus most of my remarks on these reports. So firstly, to thank the Bank of Scotland for their report on oil and gas and the presentation in Parliament last week, which I think was hosted by Murdo Fraser, although he was speaking a debate at the same time. As I understand it, the survey covered 141 oil and gas companies. Stuart Smith spoke to the report, and in his foreword, he talks about the difficult decisions still to be made on savings, jobs and investment, but that there is cautious optimism for the future, and that appears to be slowly returning. Positives included a quarter of firms surveyed had grown through the downturn and there had been an opportunity to diversify, collaborate, invest and innovate. He went on to say, we do not want to downplay the impact of depressed oil prices, but the oil and gas sector is proving to be very entrepreneurial, innovative and resilient. Now, clearly the job losses have been severe and I hope we are all concerned for those who have lost employment. But the report also speaks about how the industry, in order to survive, has become leaner, more agile and more efficient, and is set to be more competitive and sustainable for the future. In fact, there was a feeling at the briefing that you would not actually want the oil price to rise suddenly, too suddenly, in case the efficiency gains which uh, were, were, have been gained uh, were lost and inefficiency was again rewarded. I found the contrast between larger and smaller companies to be particularly interesting. 41% of all companies said they had been affected severely or quite badly by the price fall, but 67%, i.e. quite a lot more of large companies, said the same thing. So it does seem that smaller companies have done better than bigger ones. On jobs, the report says that losses have run into five figures, and 51% of companies had cut jobs. But the better news, as has, I think had been mentioned already, has been that 29% managed to keep the workforce stable and 20% managed to increase staff numbers. 
There is also clearly contrast in the costs of production between companies. One very large company was quoted as having 2,500 staff for 100,000 uh, barrels uh, per day of production, whereas a smaller one has just 50 staff for 30,000 barrels per day. That shows that the cost of production can vary dramatically from company to company and from field to field. So in consequence, there is no one oil price which is agreed to be desirable for all producers. Some businesses can in fact operate successfully and profitably with a relatively lower oil price. It was interesting to hear too that exploration continues in Saudi Arabia, this being seen as a good time because costs are lower. So it seems there can still be new, found, new, new finds around Scottish coasts as well, and perhaps the UK government should be doing more to encourage such exploration. Now moving to the item club, which is also mentioned in Labour's motion, we have the Ernst & Young Scottish Item Club forecasts. Now I have to say that it concerns me a bit that the report is, and perhaps sometimes we in Parliament also, are a little bit too focused on comparisons with the UK. It surely is not healthy for any household or country to be fixated on their neighbours, and fanatically trying to keep up with the Joneses eh, is, is not good. Of course comparisons are useful and important, but let's keep them in perspective and watch, watch what is going on in the rest of the world too. For example, if I'm reading the report correctly, US GDP eh, growth is around 23 to 2.8%, the Eurozone 1.6 to 1.9%, the UK 2.4%. So at 1.9% for Scotland, it is maybe a bit on the low side, but it is not that far out of line with European countries. And on that point, I do think there is validity in Patrick Harvey and the Greens' argument that GDP is too narrow an indicator anyway. I was interested to see that the savings ratio in Scotland is over 6% compared to UK 4%. Now, would that be a good thing or a bad thing for the economy? Some would say it is bad because it is restricting spending, which might be boosted in the short term. But if one of the UK's big problems is deficit and debt, maybe actually more saving is a good thing in the long run. The report tends to question the growth in construction as proportionately high for a relatively small sector of the economy. It wonders what will happen when the fourth crossing, Egypt, and the M8, M73, M74 are all completed. And yet that also makes me wonder where we would be if these projects had not happened. Presumably we'd be worse off. Public sector capital investment has given a much needed boost to the economy at a very difficult time. The emphasis in construction is likely to benefit men more than women, it has to be said. So perhaps it is not surprising that women in jobs fell a bit during the course of the report. Yet we note that women in employment is st still 4% above pre-crisis peak. A reminder to look at the longer term picture and not just focus on one quarter by one quarter. So we have the position that the female employment rate is 71.1% in Scotland compared to 69% in the UK. The report also states that total manufacturing exports are 5% ahead of 2013, led by transport equipment 33%, metals 21%, food 19%. By anyone's standard, these are healthy figures. Could you so begin in conclusion, I would not want to finish speaking in a debate on the economy without saying it is not just about growing the economy. Major challenges apart from growth remain, including who owns and controls the engine of the economy and who benefits from the economy doing well. In the Ernst & Young report, it is disappointing to see that they criticise the national living wage. And yet, if that puts more money in people's pockets, that can also surely boost business. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Jenny Mara. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you. Economically... We are absolutely on a knife edge with regard to the potential of Scotland re-entering a potential recession. And those are not my words, those are the words of Liz Cameron, OBE, Chief Executive of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Now much of the focus today is on the North East and the oil and gas sectors, and rightfully so, and I believe many colleagues will speak on that matter. But I would also like to focus today on some other geographic and market sectors and bring my own thoughts to this debate. Now, I represent the West Scotland region, and it's a part of Scotland which has seen much change in its core raison d'etre over the decades. It's a region which is home to Fastline, a nuclear power station, an ocean terminal, two international airports on its doorstep, and road and rail connections to the rest of the UK and beyond. Whilst Greenock imports cruise liner tourists 
Arran exports whisky. Whilst Paisley bids for City of Culture, its nearest airport now connects to New York, Toronto, Dubai. My region's history defines its very face today, from the mining towns of Ayrshire, near where I live, to the shipbuilders in the Clyde and the cotton mills south of Glasgow. It has gone from a region which basked in the glory of building great vessels, to being the semiconductor capital of the UK, to the coal center capital, and now increasingly home to big retail parks and the shoppers that it attracts. And my first job was at IBM in Greenock, just as it reached its pinnacle in laptop manufacturing. And now the place lays barren. Like many big factories, they've moved on and moved out. But the fear is still there, with Texas Instruments, as an example, looking at its future, Polaroid in Western Bartonshire doing the same. Further down the A78, Huntington Nuclear Power Station will start to wind down and decommission, with huge losses to highly skilled jobs and their families, and much uncertainty on where those skills will end up. Now, whilst I enjoy meeting businesses in my region, such as Aran Ar Aromatics on the Isle of Arran, a proper success story in North Ayrshire, they supply at retail and wholesale levels, I also hear the concerns of people who are worried that they haven't seen much big business investment in our region in recent years. Of course, I do welcome those who have made ground and progress and have ambitious plans. Ferguson Marine in Port Glasgow is a prime example. And of course, I will work with my colleagues from across the chamber to, su to support and nurture those businesses. So there is much to celebrate, but there is much to be worried about. Cunningham North and Cunningham South is ranked 66th and 68th respectively in terms of employment rates in Scotland on a scale of 1 to 73. Greenock is 63rd, Clyde Bank 51st. There is so much more we can do. Now I'll turn to my opening statement on the potential recession in Scotland. Uh, Jack Jackie Bailey and Myrtle Fraser have already talked about the Fraser Valander Institution downgrading its growth forecasts. I would like to elaborate more on what they said. Professor Brian Ashcroft of that institute, and I quote, said, the Scottish economy came within a hair's breadth of recession last year, and with little improvement recently, may fail to avoid a recession in the coming months. It pointed out that even though the service sector registered growth of 0.3% in the final quarter of last year, UK services grew three times faster. It said that financial services were especially weak. It said manufacturing growth can only be described as weak. It's not just the oil and gas sector facing a rocky road. Many sectors are teetering on the brink. And whilst I absolutely accept and appreciate that there are often international, external and uncontrollable factors which have influenced the state of our economy, I do believe that there are some immediate and practical things the Scottish Government can do to help business in Scotland across all sectors. The first, non-domestic rates. I welcome the continued commitment to help small businesses with rate relief. The high street is struggling and we collectively must do all we can to help it. But many medium and large sized businesses are deeply concerned about the hike in the large business supplement from 1.3 pence to 2.6. The doubling of this rate will provide a burden of 60 million pounds in Scottish business. Modernizing the structure of business rates should take into account all stakeholders involved, such as the Federation of Small Business and the Scottish Retail Consortium. It should not see big business as a cash cow on business rates. There must be a fine balance between the need for that revenue, but the needs of the businesses to grow and invest. The second is on income tax. And this one is really simple for the Scottish Conservatives. For Scotland to remain competitive, then we should pay no more income tax than the rest of the UK. Uh, I'm in my last 30 seconds, sorry. In summary, we will support moves that attract investment and growth in our country, but we shouldn't demonize big business in the process. A broad, bit, a broad mix of small, medium and large businesses is essential, and we as a parliament must keep our eye on the ball if we are to avoid recession. And just as we focus today on the necessary actions we must take on the oil and gas sector, we must equally come up with practical, bold and immediate measures to encourage growth across all sectors. 
When we go back to our varied constituencies, we should not be complacent when we see the relics of industry on our doorstep. We should come back here with ideas. Thank you. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, this is my first speech this Parliament, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome you to, to your position and also to all the newly elected members across the, the Chamber. I hope you enjoy it and feel the deep privilege of representing your constituents as deeply as I do. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate Finlay Carson on his maiden speech this afternoon. Presiding Officer, I'm going to use my speaking time today uh, to talk about the uh, decommissioning industry of oil and gas, which is of particular interest and relevance to my home city of Dundee. Just three months ago, Presiding Officer, the Douglas Westwood industry report told us that nearly 150 oil platforms are expected to be scrapped over the next 10 years. But of specific interest to me, and what should be of critical interest to this chamber and this government is the analysis that, and I quote, of all the decommissioning over the next 25 years, more than half is likely to take place between 2019 and 2026. Now, as my colleague Jackie Bailey said in her opening remarks, we don't want to decommission too early. That is the last thing we want but we don't want to miss the opportunity for Scottish jobs and Scottish workers. If we are not ready for the opportunities of decommissioning, it is clear that these opportunities will literally sail past us, as many are at the moment. Now, let's be realistic about this, presiding officer. The bulk of this work will really take off in 2019, and that's what the industry experts tell us. That's less than three years from now. And given the lead-in times that companies need to select the correct decommissioning programme and facilities, are we anywhere near ready to seize these opportunities for Scottish workers? Perhaps we are far further north, as Tavish Scott uh, said in his closing remarks today, but, presiding officer, we are not in my home city of Dundee. I have been making the case now, as my colleagues from the last Parliament will know, for a few years on the opportunities of decommissioning in Dundee and that the Scottish Government should be assisting our city to become a hub for decommissioning work. We have a deep water port. We have a spacious quayside for deconstruction. We have free industrial land for all the spin-off capacity. We have a research base in our universities for decommissioning. We have a very good college for training programmes for young workers. We have a strong engineering base. We still have a proud thirst for industrial jobs. Presiding officer, we have a shortage of work. We have a chronic shortage of work. We have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country and eye-watering youth unemployment. But what we do not have is any assistance from the Scottish Government to bring decommissioning jobs to Dundee. Now, other parties in this chamber, including the government benches, started to agree with my campaign for decommissioning jobs in Dundee during the recent election campaign. But we have still to see any action or any money spent at all. And, presiding officer, I welcome the money that has been spent in Aberdeen and spent in Lerwick, but not one penny of Scottish Government money is coming to industrial development in our city to support the potential for this industry. And with the dates proffered by the Douglas Westwood report, I want the Government to say today, I want the Cabinet Secretary to say today in his closing remarks, if they are committed to assisting Dundee to become a decommissioning hub because they simply can't wait any longer. Fourth Ports, who own the Port of Dundee, made a £10, sorry, £10 million investment in our port earlier this year. Now, although this is very welcome, anyone looking at this industry will know that this amount of money does not go nearly far enough to prepare a port for such large-scale industry. Indeed, I understand that that sum is being used to repair an existing quayside. 
But the key thing about this £10 million investment was that Forth Port's chief executive, Charles Hammond, explicitly called on the Scottish Government that day when he announced the investment to make public money investment in our port. Now, oil platforms are sailing past unemployed workers in Dundee, presiding officer, sailing all the way down to Hartlepool, where local development agencies had the foresight to secure these jobs for their people. So where is the Scottish Government's industrial investment in Dundee? As yet, Dundee City Council have still not put together its application for a city deal. I understand that they were kicking around ideas at a recent stakeholders meeting, but with no focus or mention on decommissioning whatsoever. Cabinet Secretary, the people in Dundee need you today to commit to the following. That you will instruct Scottish enterprise and industry experts to prepare and publish an emergency scoping report on what is possible for decommissioning in Dundee. This is a simple ask which should have been done a long time ago anyway. But given the timescales of these opportunities and the dire need for jobs in my city, the Cabinet Secretary, I think, has a moral and political obligation to the people I represent to make this commitment this afternoon. Thank you. Very tight speeches of up to six minutes from now on, please. Ash Denham to be followed by Alec Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's economy does indeed face challenges, and not least because Scotland sits within the overall wider context of ongoing UK austerity. That notion that cutting spending is necessary to boost growth or expansionary fiscal contraction still has authority in the UK, and that means that most Britons just don't realise the extent to which we have now diverged from the thinking on this issue in the rest of the Western world. Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner in economics, noted... Since the global turn to austerity in 2010, every country that introduced significant austerity has seen its economy suffer, with the depth of the suffering closely related to the harshness of the austerity. He goes on to state that this austerian ideology that dominated elite discourse five years ago has collapsed to the point where hardly anyone still believes it, hardly anyone that is except the UK government and most of the British media. Apologies, I have to make progress. Austerity doesn't work if you want to grow the economy, so why are we still suffering it? After the crash in 2008, it became obvious that monetary policy wasn't going to be enough to fight the downturn. In those conditions, the correct response is fiscal expansion, government spending to create jobs and put money into consumers' pockets. As Keynes wrote in 37, the boom, not the slump, is the right time for austerity at the Treasury. But what actually happened was a focus on slashing deficits mainly with spending cuts. Even though history and practice suggested that cutting spending in a depressed economy without the ability to offset by reducing interest rates would hasten decline, the austerian ideology, championed by people like Alessina from Harvard and others, was embraced by the European Commission, by the European Central Bank and by the UK government. Alessina's research was later found out to be flawed and all the economic research that allegedly supported that austerity push has now mainly been discredited. And this has led the IMF, an architect and indeed site manager of neoliberalism, to publish an article this week in their in-house magazine that neoliberalism has been oversold and that austerity should be ended. The article noted that short-run costs of lower output and welfare and higher unemployment have been underplayed and that the desirability of simply living with high debt and allowing debt ratios to decline organically through growth is underappreciated. Austerity is self-defeating and debt limits by themselves are meaningless. The UK government's own targets require further cuts. On top of the 12 billion cut announced in the 2015 spending review, George Osborne has announced a further as yet unallocated 3.5 billion cut to departmental spending. In Scotland, our discretionary budget will be 3.3 billion lower in real terms than it was in 2011. It should also be noted that in Westminster, Labour have acquiesced on this austerity narrative, voting with the Tories in 2015 to accept... Okay. I am, I am indeed grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Um, does she perhaps recall, she wasn't in the Parliament then, but that 
her government, the SNP government, um, just literally before the election, had an opportunity in their budget to end austerity. Can she perhaps explain why they chose not to do so? Ash Denham. I think in talking about the wider context, we need to talk about what Westminster is doing, as they have clearly more levers in this department than the Scottish Government do. And the Labour Party will, of course, recall that they accepted the £30 billion worth of cuts that the Tories put forward. George Osborne said that these cuts will make Britain fit for the future, but it does beg the question, fit for whom? Almost certainly not fit for Scotland. Why? Because the UK government attempted to cut £7 billion just recently from the Scottish budget this year. In my view, austerity has been embraced so profoundly because the primary purpose of it is to provide the necessary cover to massively shrink government spending. As David Cameron said in 2013, to make the state leaner, not just now, but permanently. And so the overriding goal is a permanent and irreversible reduction to our public goods, services and social security. If the Conservatives in this chamber want to do something useful for the Scottish economy, they should urge their colleagues in London to ditch this damaging austerity mantra in favour of investment in things like R&D, innovation and education. The UK government controls the key taxation levers affecting the oil and gas sector and so it must take the action needed to protect businesses and jobs. In Scotland, with the powers that we do have, we plan to take a different approach. Our economic strategy will be to maximise our investment in infrastructure, in skills, to drive innovation, boost exports and promote more inclusive growth wherever we can. We plan a can-do innovation forum to develop a range of actions as part of a sustained national programme to boost productivity through innovation. We will prioritise infrastructure investment over the next parliament. 20 billion, I'm sorry, I'm in my last half a minute, will be invested into a major infrastructure programme designed to help build Scotland's future. Our infrastructure plans will support around 30,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the wider economy, with projects the length and breadth of the country, including road, rail, ferries and early years childcare and schools and health facilities. In my constituency, investment is underway at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary site with 230 million going to the new Royal Hospital for Sick Children and the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. The intellectual case for austerity is bankrupt and it is time for the UK government to catch up with the thinking on this matter in the rest of Europe. Alex Johnson to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. There are, Deputy Presiding Officer, many new faces and new voices in this Parliament. And we've heard another one of them today, Finn Carson's opening speech. Uh, first speech in this Parliament was an excellent one. Surely we're getting to the end of the list. We'll see. But one of the things that those of us who are familiar with this Parliament will be well aware of was the habit that John Swinney had when he was the Economy Minister in the last Parliament. Because as we all know, over the last years since the recession of 2008, Scotland has done rather well. The economic figures were very encouraging, yet as time went on, month by month, some months Scotland would do better than the rest of the UK, other months the rest of the UK would do better than Scotland. And of course, John Swinney, in the months when Scotland had done better than the rest of the UK, would stand up and take credit for this advancement. <laughs> Meanwhile, the following month, when the figures were the other way around, he would stand up and blame the UK government or George Osborne for all the problems Scotland faced. The truth was that Scotland and the rest of the UK were perhaps slightly out of kilter, but year on year we were achieving the same things. The problem we face now is that we are no longer aligned. Scotland and the rest of the UK have begun to diverge and the figures are demonstrating that each month as they're published. I would suggest that one of the reasons for that is that the Scottish Government now has more power to encourage different approaches within the Scottish economy and that it is enforcing the wrong policies and beginning to reap the dividend of that failure. 
However, uh, yes, very briefly. Paul Wheelhouse. I thank Alex Johnson for taking the intervention. Would he accept there are areas of policy in which the UK government could be described as taking the wrong decisions? For example, 35 billion being thrown at the nuclear power industry and not backing Scotland's renewables industry. Alex Johnson. Uh, I think perhaps it would have been beneficial to the Scottish economy if we'd been building a nuclear power station as well. But that decision, I suggest, is one that should have been taken some time ago. Let me address the let me address the, the government's amendment today. I think on a day when the Labour Party have brought a very reasoned, uh, re well-reasoned uh, motion to Parliament, and the Conservatives will support it, the Scottish Government have made the mistake of bringing forward an amendment that is, I'm afraid, simply over-optimistic. In a week when the oil price has fallen by 6%, and I've checked the figures just before I, sp I stood up to speak, it is irresponsible of the government to take this over-optimistic approach. We must, at this moment, be working hard to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. And that's why, as we look specifically at the oil industry, there are a number of things that we must uh, deal with. The UK government have taken the actions that they promised in relation to taxation. But the Scottish Government have not taken the opportunity it could have taken to ensure that the economy in the North East in particular is resilient enough to stand situations like the one we're in today. Decisions made over taxation have resulted in further pressure on the North East housing market. And if you've seen the unemployment figures that were made available in the past few days and are surprised to discover that Aberdeen constituencies still have the lowest unemployment rates anywhere in Scotland, you must remember that that is because many of the people losing their jobs cannot afford to stay in the North East once that job is gone. And as a result, they leave. And that's why, because we have serious problems with housing not least of which the government's own land and business uh, taxation system, which has resulted in enormous pressure being put on more expensive homes. And remember, these more expensive homes that exist in the North East are a symptom of housing shortage, not a symptom of some form of wealth that the government feels it should tax. At the same time, failures in provision in the North East mean that our schools have unfilled teaching posts. Many of our healthcare facilities have unfilled posts too. The services that are being provided are simply not up to the population that we have. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about the government's, uh, about the Aberdeen City Region deal. When it was announced and the shared funding was published, the Scottish Government went scrambling around looking for other things previously, re previously announced or projects it could include and add the value to, so it could claim it was putting more money into that, the North East than the UK Government. And that's why we got commitments on things like the East Coast Main Line at Montrose, the Grade Separated Junction at Lawrencekirk, and other promises. But even this in the past week, we found that the Scottish Government now tell us that these spending commitments will only be fulfilled as part of a 10-year programme. Would you begin promise, to close, please? A promise which simply is not being kept. I want to see this Government and this Minister bring forward the spending commitments on a timescale that aligns with the expectations of the people he promised it to only a few short months ago. Thank you, Mr Johnson. We now move to the last of the closing speeches. I'd appreciate brevity, please, Mr Macdonald. <laughs> Up to six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officers. Cities standing strong is one of the opening comments in the Ernest & Young Scottish Item Club report. It continues, Scotland's three largest cities, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, are crucial to the overall health of the economy, accounting for over 35% of total employment and 40% of business services employment. So I want to focus on, on Edinburgh, and the strength of Edinburgh's economy lies in its well-educated population, with over 42% of working age residents educated to degree level or above, a figure higher than any other UK city outside of London. 
That highly skilled workforce helped Edinburgh to attract 33 major foreign direct investment projects, ensuring Scotland attracted more of these investment projects than any other part of the UK outside of London. Edinburgh's strength lies in its financial services, life sciences, technology and tourism. The Ernest & Young report and its city focus on Edinburgh highlights that Edinburgh's financial services remain critical and that employment in Edinburgh is growing out, outpaced both Scotland and the UK. The Council report Capital Facts highlights that Edinburgh is the UK's second largest financial centre and a major European centre for asset management and asset servicing. More than 90% of all Scottish fund managers are based in the Lothian area. Edinburgh's life science research is among the best in the world, combining world-leading academic researchers, cutting-edge companies and science parks that encourage close collaboration. I recently attended an award ceremony where a local company, Alba Bioscience, a company that has the good sense to employ my youngest son, has a, was awarded the Queen's Award for Enterprise in the category of Outstanding Achievement in International Trade. Then there is the technology and software sector, where Edinburgh is home to some of Europe's leading tech companies, including Skyscanner, Amazon, Microsoft, and Rockstar North. The value of this sector has grown by 58% since 2010. Tourism is also key to Edinburgh's economic success. Last year, Edinburgh Airport had its busiest ever year with 11 million passengers. Four million tourists visited the city, injecting 1.2 billion into the local economy. Hotel occupancy levels are at nearly 82%, hitting 92% during the festival, and occupancy levels are still increasing year on year. Despite new hotel openings, uh, we are also seeing revenue per room increasing. This improving employment situation in Edinburgh is resu resulting in a reduction of people claiming benefits and in a population increase of around 100 people per week as people are attracted to the area to gain employment. New businesses are taking advantage of this buoyant part of the economy with over 1,900 new business businesses recorded over the three months to April 2016. That's a 16% increase on the number of new businesses started over the same period last year. In order to house the new workers attracted to Edinburgh, the NHBC have highlighted that there has been a 52% increase in new build starts for residential dwellings between 2014 and 2015, supporting many jobs in the traditional trades and apprenticeships during the construction phase. Last week, I visited the traditional building skills and materials event held in St Andrews Square. A range of trades were being demonstrated by apprentices based at Edinburgh College. 19% of buildings in our cities were built over 100 years ago, and many are in need of repair or renovation. There is now a need for stonemasons and plasterers, and we need to encourage small businesses who work in this area to take on new apprentices if we want to preserve these buildings for future generation. Gen uh, Presiding officer, there is no doubt the downturn of oil and gas has had an impact on Scotland's economy. However, as I've highlighted, much of our economy is doing well, and that is despite Scotland getting little benefit from the £330 billion from oil and gas paid to the UK Exchequer since 1975. It's maybe about time we got some of that money back to invest in our country's future while we're in a situation where we need to support jobs to oil and gas gets back on its feet again. Thank you, Mr Macdonald. Um, we now move to closing speeches and I call Alexander Burnett. Uh, six minutes, please, Mr Burnett. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to make a declaration of my registrable interests. I own and manage property, including commercial lettings. Uh, as MSP for Aberdeenshire West, I'm already well aware of the many challenges we've heard today that Scotland's oil and gas sector has faced in recent months and the impact this is having on local and national economies. 
Price volatility has changed the landscape of a sector as prices fell by 70%, hitting a low of $27. Inevitably, this has led to job losses and decreased investment, particularly in the Northeast. On the international level, many oil analysts see no significant upswing in crude oil prices without OPEC's intervention, an unlikely outcome at this stage. However, the outlook is not unrelentingly bleak. Britain's oil and gas industry's annual activity survey recently showed output up by nearly 10%, the best exploration hit rate for 10 years, and a significant fall in extraction costs. It is a challenge for both the Scottish and UK governments to ensure that the industry is nurtured through these hard times. Within the last week, reports by the Bank of Scotland and PwC show significant job losses are still to be expected, and there is a two-year window for action. More positively, the reports found that th firms are, are forming new partnerships, seeking new international opportunities, and diversifying into new markets. Both reports show that sustainable growth is on the horizon, and it is encouraging to see the sector progressing. Now, at Oil & Gas UK's conference yesterday, I met with a range of stakeholders. It was clear that the UK government has made the UK continental shelf the most fiscally competitive in the world, and I heard from Stephen Halliday, Group President at Wood Mackenzie, that the UK now has one of the best and simplest tax systems. Uh, it was the speech after the Cabinet Secretary, so I'm not quite sure how he missed it, uh, but we have still seen greater progress in cost reduction, and we still need to see greater collaboration. I believe that Andy Samuel, the Chief Executive for the Oil and Gas Authority, is best placed to bring company leaders together. Now, if a fiscal regime is acknowledged by the industry as working, and the regulatory regime of the OGA making progress, there is a third branch which needs action. And with the right support, small and medium-sized enterprise that exist in the supply chain can grow from the 2.5% of global share they currently enjoy to over 10% of a global market worth 100 billion. This is a sector over twice the size of the aerospace industry, and one which would continue beyond the life cycle of the North Sea. After my maiden speech, Stuart Stevenson spoke that we would have little overlap, so I am pleased on only my second contribution to have found a common cause. Now, we have already seen an unprecedented level of support for the industry from this Conservative government over the last two budgets. And last week, I met with the Chancellor, and in particular, we discussed Treasury-backed loans. I am pleased to say he was receptive to calls to expand the UK loan guarantee scheme, which would help secure new investment in oil and gas infrastructure. And this, I hope, will satisfy Gillian Martin in her calls for conversations with Westminster. Now, whilst the UK government has shown its support, local companies are facing a different challenge. Scotland should not be the highest tax part of the UK, and we welcome the Scottish government's decision to review business rates. Yeah. Keith Brown. I've heard a number of thanks for taking the intervention, first of all. I've heard a number of comments from the Conservatives about cutting taxes. Can you explain why it would be the case that you would oppose a cut in the highest air passenger duty tax in the world? Do you not think that would benefit the economy, including the North East? Alexander Burnett. Uh, very briefly, on, th on that point, that was also raised with the Chancellor, and he pointed out that the cut in APD is actually very uh, insignificant in terms of the overall cost of a flight. Uh, and is, is not seen as a uh, particularly effective reduction. Uh, but, back, but back to business rates. You know, this affects businesses all over. As my colleague Jamie Green pointed out, quoting from the Fraser of Allender report, which said that Scotland was flirting with recession. Now, regardless of the outcome of this review, we urge the government to freeze business rates until the recommendations are implemented. Additionally, we re remain committed to doubling the business rates incentivisation scheme so that local authorities are allowed to keep all of the additional revenue raised from the tax. And as we heard from Finlay Carson in his excellent maiden speech, fine constituencies like Galloway and West Dumfries have much to gain from this scheme, but I would maybe give a note of caution regarding any zip wire photo opportunities. <laughs> now, business rates have been this Scottish Government's cash cow, but I have now heard of people considering pulling down buildings to avoid business rates which are too punitive. This would see a return to the days of window and roof taxes, where people destroyed capital assets, unable to meet poorly thought taxation measures, and it is a route that Scotland's balance sheet can ill afford. Now, returning to the amendment, with a current moratorium pre preventing onshore gas production, 
we find ourselves in a position where companies cannot invest into the long-term future of the industry. Scotland is currently missing out on a jobs boom and the opportunity to get energy bills down. But elsewhere in the debate, we heard from Ivan McKee the importance of training, the extremely knowledgeable Lewis MacDonald on the importance of investment in northeast infrastructure, Patrick Harvey, as always ideologically honest but somewhat separated from the reality facing the sector in the northeast, <laughs> Ta Tavish Scott on the dangers of the industry and the ultimate price that is sometimes tragically paid. John Mason on the sensible recognition of cost reductions, and Jenny Mara, an excellent maiden speech, highlighting the importance of decommissioning. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, we also heard, heard from Ash Denham, Alex Johnson. Could you Johnson, come to a close, please, Mr. Burnett? McDonald's. Before you say anything else, whatever wrong, I've used, saving you for yourself. Whatever I've used, Scotland's economy, and in particular oil and gas, face challenges. Whether attracting investment, maintaining staff numbers, or adapting to a slump in prices, I urge the Scottish Government to do all it can to support and sustain this important sector, and that is why I'm supporting the amendment put down by Murdo Fraser. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I call on Keith Brown. Eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I start by saying I think there's been a, a lot more consensus, perhaps, in the debate than we might have expected. Of course, there are uh, points of disagreement, but generally consensual and constructive. I would highlight uh, Finlay Carson's inaugural speech. Uh, I don't know whether it's the case that he plagiarised various tourist brochures. I'm sure he didn't, but I'm sure that the tourist organisations in his constituency were very keen on the first part of his speech for the way that he described, uh, in very glowing terms, his constituency. Um, I should also say that uh, the points made by other Conservatives, Murdo Fraser and Alexander Burnett, should, I think, be responded, first of all, on loan guarantees, which we have been calling for for some time. And it is good to see the Conservatives catching up at last with the idea of how important loan guarantees might be to this industry. If they'd been talking to the industry previously, they would have understood the importance of loan guarantees for maintaining and improving the infrastructure for the vitality of some of the smaller and medium-sized players. It's not enough to mention it in a budget and forget it for months. There has to be pace. The industry will tell you this if you speak to them. There has to be pace behind that. So let's get on and do it. Stop this talking about it and let's crack on and do that. And I have to say, if um, yeah, Alexander Burnett wants to go to Aberdeen Airport and tell them the APD will have a negligible effect on air operations, I'd be interested to see what the response would, he, would be, uh, he would get from the airport. There is no question that APD being cut is now the highest tax of its type in the world. It's not environmental tax. I think everyone's passed that uh, pretense by now, and it's vitally important to economic recovery. And it just stuns me as to why the Conservatives do not want to support that. I should also say, in the least, I'll take... Alexander Burnett. On the subject of APD, if, if Aberdeen is that concerned about uh, small changes in prices, do you think it might con should consider its car parking duties? <laughs> Keith Brown. I've had no representations from the airport on their car parking duties. I have had many representations on the beneficial effects of a cut in APD. And can also say, in relation to Alec Johnson's point about uh, the North East, I did hear from the Conservative benches, in fact, I think the member is here, the claim that the £250 million going to the city deal was from the UK government. Utterly false. It's not. £125 million from the Scottish Government, £125 million from the UK Government. We asked the UK Government to make a bigger city deal. They refused to do it. So we announced a further £254 million of investment. And we also said, um, Alec Johnson kind of infers that this was a... Let me just finish the point, first of all. Uh, infers that this was a, a change to what we said. We said at the same time it will have the same lifetime as the city deal, the 10-year deal. That does not mean it will take 10 years necessarily to do that. What I did say in relation to the Lawrence Kirk, uh, Lawrence Kirk overpass was it's important to recognise that that may include a public inquiry and nobody can predict how long a public inquiry will take. I'll take the intervention from Alec Johnson. Alex Johnson. I was simply going to say, Minister, is it not the case that the money is not invested until you've actually found it and spent it? And at the moment, we don't know when that's going to happen. Keith Brown. Well, first of all, we've made the commitment to that and to the uh, Montre Montrose Junction, as you said. We have to go through the processes, first of all, before you can build it, and that's the uh, statutory processes. If I was to say we'll do it in two years, I'd be accused of not allowing the public to have the full say on these developments. So, of course, we have to do that. I can also say, in relation to the point that uh, Tavish Scott uh, made, I, I regret the fact that the uh, Liberal Democrat amendment wasn't taken. I think it makes some very important points, especially about decommissioning. I have to say, made much more constructively than the rant that we heard from Jenny Mara about the Scottish Government. And had it been the case that the uh, amendment had come forward from Lib Dems, I would have felt happy uh, to support that. 
I think it's very important to say that, of course, decommissioning represents a huge opportunity, and the point that's been made by Tavis Scott about making sure we maximise what we can get from that is very important. It has, cannot be premature, and certainly from the discussions that Paul Wheelhouse and myself had with the trade unions, they're very keen on that as well. But there's a huge dividend, not least because of the obligations of the original licence holders in the North Sea to pay for decommissioning. A lot of money will go into this. There's a huge benefit, and Tavish Scott is quite right to say we should make sure we access that benefit. In relation to Jackie Bailey, um, I have to say it was a tortured expression on her face when I asked her to welcome the 11,000 people that found jobs in the last month that said it all. It is important that we take a balanced approach. Now, I have said, and you can ask the people in the industry I've spoken to, I have acknowledged at every point the challenges that we have. The figures that we mentioned by the various reports, I accept those figures and accept that there's challenges in relation both to the oil and gas industry and to the wider economy. It's also my responsibility to point out where things are going well. It's very important that we... I will very briefly, yeah. Jackie Bailey. Um, you know, it might have escaped his attention, but I actually welcomed much of the activity of the Scottish Government. I think we are faced with a report that says today Scotland's economy is on the brink of recession and simply listing past achievements doesn't actually do anything to resolve that problem. Keith Brown. But I take from that that Jackie Bailey is obviously unhappy about the 11,000 people that have got jobs in the course of the last month. And I also say that that was not the tenor of her speech. The tenor of her, her speech was to point out everything negative that she could. Now, we have to accept there are challenges, but we, we undermine rather than enhance our economic prospects if we don't acknowledge and tackle, of course, the challenges, but we also have to acknowledge and tackle the things that we're doing right if we want to do more of that. That seems to me to be self-evident. We have to not lose sight of the fact that the economy is built on strong foundations, nearly 2% growth in the last year. The same reports which have been mentioned predict growth for this year, for next year and the year afterwards. That's what they predict, the, the reports that have been mentioned. But there is no question there are difficult times. We have, for example, had a record year for inward investment. Again, not something that Jackie Bailey felt able to, to uh, welcome. Startling performance in terms of inward investment, not only in terms of uh, projects which have been built on previous ones, but also in terms of new projects, around 190 19 of those and a, a record uh, for Scotland. So some real uh, genuine uh, achievements in relation to that. Also a record number uh, of co registered companies in Scotland. I mean a fantastic achievement. Uh, also in terms of youth unemployment mentioned by a couple of members there are real challenges there over 13 percent. We acknowledge that. One of the lowest rates in the whole of Europe. Uh, Cloudbook Technologies, a US technology company also announced last week planning to establish its European headquarters in Glasgow, planning to create 125 jobs in the city. And we've heard uh, from Paul Wheelhouse about the announcement today in Nig Bay. We also had the BP announcement about 500 uh, new jobs, temporary jobs, but new jobs. And the point was made, I think, from the Conservative benches about the, I think it was Alexander Burnett, about the uh, productivity being highest, I think, for 15 years. The first, no, I've given me a number of times already, I'm sorry. Uh, so we've had uh, that uh, bonus and also the recovery in the price, such as it is, from £27 uh, 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 up to around £50 uh, a barrel. And as was pointed out, I think it was by Julian Martin previously, that had gone down to $14 uh, a barrel. So we have seen an improvement. We all know how price sensitive uh, the industry is. So we do believe we have done a number of key things which are right. We should never say that's all we can do. We have to listen, and I'll listen to the points that Jackie Bailey made in terms, not in our motion, but in our subsequent uh, press release, not least in relation to the proposal in terms of further support for the infrastructure uh, in the North East. We've also considered that and are happy Happy to work with others to make sure that the UK government does these things as quickly as it should. Uh, so we have to build on success and we have to, uh, of course, address the challenges that we have. Uh, as we raised in the previous debate, delivering our labour market strategy, focusing on skills, of course, that's very important. And the point was made, I think, again by Gillian Martin, that although some of those jobs have been lost, the skills have been kept in the local economy, some of those skills have gone elsewhere, but they're still within the industry, again, which is uh, very uh, important for the upturn. So, presenting officer, growing our economy is obviously vital uh, in increasing living standards and, in turn, of course, very important now for this part Parliament, generating the tax revenues which can be reinvested in the economy, our infrastructure and in our public services. These links are more important than ever in view of the new powers over taxation that have been devolved to the Parliament. It is a question that there are challenges, but there are also things which we're doing extremely well at, and we have to have that balance. Close, please, this government, government will ensure Secretary. that growing the economy and promoting inclusive growth will remain central to everything that we do, and I would ask for the support for the amendment in my name.
I now call Richard Leonard to close the debate. Ten minutes, please, Mr Leonard. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, in the front room of the Rail, Maritime and Transport Union office in Crown Street in Aberdeen is a model. Built by craftspeople, uh, by metal workers, it is a model of the Piper Alpha platform. It serves as a reminder that however we divide at the end of this debate, we must all unite around a singular determination that never again will a compromise to health and safety, resulting in such a tragic loss of human life, still being felt by widows, orphans and survivors across the country, never again will that happen. There have been some, there have been some excellent contributions to the debate and there has been a degree of uh, consensus uh, on a shared agenda and I particularly want to pay tribute to uh, Finlay Carson who was making his uh, first speech. Deputy Presiding Officer, when we are discussing oil and gas, we are discussing a natural and a national asset, a common treasury, which incidentally should never, never have been left entirely in the hands of private corporations whose fiduciary duty and whose first duty is to make profits pure and simple. As contribution after contribution this afternoon has shown, this debate is not simply about the oil and gas industry, it is about the very future of the Scottish economy, and that's why we tabled this motion. Because if this Parliament is to speak for the people, which I believe it must, it must be a voice for the voiceless, including those oil and gas workers living in fear of the future. If this Parliament is to speak for the people on the big economic issues of the day, rising unemployment, the political choice of austerity and to Ash Denham, it's a choice that's been taken here as well as in Whitehall. The issue as well of inequality, including the unequal distribution of power in our economy, we need as a parliament to listen to the oil and gas industry and to the oil and gas industry trade unions. And frankly, not the air of complacency about the government's stance this afternoon. We must listen to the scale and speed of these job cuts in this one sector of our industrial base alone. 84,000 jobs lost in 2015, 40,000 more to go this year. As we've heard this afternoon, 50,000 of those in Scotland. And yet the government says we should take an interest in innovation prizes and business pledges. Well, uh, one of my colleagues checked into this and out of over 300,000 registered businesses in, businesses in Scotland, only 272 have signed the business pledge. Exploration is at its lowest level for 45 years. Just 13 exploration wells this year, between six and 10 uh, forecast uh, for next year. Listen to Deidre Meekie, the head of Oil and Gas UK, who warned just last week, and I quote, we are an industry at the edge of a chasm. If we have a duty as a parliament to listen to this evidence, then we have a duty placed upon us to speak up and act as well. And so if something is not working as it should, like the transition training fund is not working, it is the duty of this parliament to say so. And if the energy jobs task force isn't yet preventing any redundancies and isn't yet creating any new jobs in transferable sectors like offshore renewable energy or oil rig decommissioning, and doesn't appear to be successful in its mission, and I quote, to retain and grow the talents and skills in the industry, it is the duty of this parliament to say so. And if compared to the Norwegian sector, which has the distinct advantage, the major advantage of common ownership in the operation of their oil fields, if the Norwegian sector is able to deliver collaboration, a degree of cooperation, and standardized technology to cut costs, why can't we do it here? Despite the best efforts of the Energy Jobs Task Force, offshore operators are instructing offshore contractors this afternoon to slash the terms and conditions of employment by 25% to cut their costs and keep their profits up. Then we need to say as a parliament that enough is enough. The oil and gas workers, the ordinary men and women, the drillers, the engineering construction workers, the caterers, the service hands, the maritime crews, they are saying to us in this Parliament that they want the right to work and they want the right to work in place of fear. And that's what's important to us. And that's why we say to the Cabinet Secretary, 
that we need a new approach. I was hearing this week when I met with the oil unions in Aberdeen that their members are facing an added injustice. They said to me that many offshore oil and gas workers haven't been made redundant, they have been reclassified. Reclassified as ad hoc workers. Some of them termed long-term ad hoc workers, which is another way of describing them as zero hours contract workers. And we also know there is much bogus self-employment onshore and offshore in the industry, so many workers who should be entitled to it are not even receiving basic redundancy payments. And let me turn to decommissioning. Of course, where there is a genuine exhaustion, wells should be closed and rigs decommissioned. It's happening with Shell in the Alpha, Bravo and Delta fields already. They already have OGA authorization. Delta is completely decommissioned already. And as we de debate this motion, there are workers on board Alpha and Bravo platforms working towards their complete decommission uh, decommissioning as well. But let me say this. First of all, we want decommissioning to be carried out in a planned way, in facilities which are based here, by workers who are based here and not overseas. And if that's in Dundee, as Jenny Mara suggests, then we need to consider that seriously. The second thing I want to say is this. We fear that wells will be closed and assets written off prematurely because extraction is deemed to be, in inverted commas, uneconomic by the operators. There are 20 billion barrels of oil equivalent still to be recovered. These are common assets which should not be written off. Presiding officer, we need determination in this parliament, a renewed determination to say to these working people and the communities of the northeast of Scotland that we are on your side, that now more than ever, we want to invest in your future, that you have a future. No one is claiming that the Scottish Government can single-handedly save the industry, but we do at least expect it to have an ambitious but credible strategy for retaining jobs and skills, a strategy for skills and technology transfer, and a decommissioning strategy in cooperation with the OGA. And if I can give one example of what I mean just this week, it is my understanding that the contract to supply jackets for the SSE offshore Beatrice wind farm project have been placed. I am delighted to understand that the contract to construct 26 jackets have been awarded to Burnt Island fabricators in Fife. But I am outraged that twice as many as that have been placed in yards overseas. That simply is not good enough. And this afternoon, we call on the Scottish Government to take this matter up urgently. We want to anchor the oil and gas supply chain in the North East. We want to support diversification by proper planning and intervention by government so that we join together an industrial strategy for decommissioning rigs and fields with new investment in subsea offshore renewable energy and the full use of our existing skills, technology and engineering base. So let's this afternoon give people hope for the future. That is what this parliament should be about, that we will not relinquish control to market forces, that in a part of the economy where, yes, there are powerful global corporate forces at work, there can also be powerful democratic forces at work too. And I hope that at least we can unite around that idea and act to restore the confidence of people in politics. I move the Labour motion. Sorry, point of order, Jackie Bailey. Ah, there we go. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown yesterday answered a parliamentary question, S5W00367, and stated that 2,500 individuals and 100 employers were helped by the Energy Jobs Task Force. His amendment, lodged about one hour later, said it was 8,800 individuals and 100 employers. Now, in response to question S5W00369, answered by Jamie Hepburn today, the number is back to 2,500. I would ask, Presiding Officer, that the Cabinet Secretary perhaps is invited to reflect 
on this discrepancy and come back to Parliament to correct the record. Uh, I thank Ms Billy for uh, the notification of the point of order. I don't believe it is a point of order. However, the Cabinet Minister will have heard your, uh, your point and will be in a position to reflect on it if he chooses to do so. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 475 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 475. Moved. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion 475 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion uh, 466. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the aforesaid 466 on committee meetings. Formally moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. And as I said earlier, uh, we will call all the votes from yesterday uh, from Tuesday the 24th to 14th of June first, and then call the votes from today's business. And there are seven questions to be put today. In regard to the debate on the contribution of colleges and universities to Scotland's success on Tuesday the 14th of June, I wish to remind members that if the amendment in the name of Liz Smith is agreed, the amendment in the name of Ian Gray falls. And the first question is that amendment 431.1 in the name of Liz Smith which seeks to amend motion 431 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on the contribution of colleges and universities to Scotland's success be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Members may press their, their buttons now. The result of the vote is as follows, yes 29, no 95, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 431.2 in the name of Ian Gray, uh, which seeks to amend motion 431 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament will therefore vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote, Amendment 431.2, is as follows. Yes, 33. No, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion 431, in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville, uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament will vote. Members may cast their votes now. And the result of the vote on motion 431 is as follows. Yes, 95. No, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. We now turn to the uh, questions arising from today's business. And I would also remind members that there's a preemption on the First Amendment. That is, if we agree the amendment in the name of Keith Brown, the amendment in the name of Murder Fraser will fall. 
So the next question is that amendment 448.3 in the name of Keith Brown, which seeks to amend motion 448 in the name of Jackie Bailey on the economy be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. We will move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. And the result of the vote on amendment 448.3 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 66. No, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the amendment in the name of Murder Fraser therefore falls. The next question is therefore that a motion 448 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament will move to vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 448 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended is as follows. Yes, 66. No, 58. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Uh, there is one final question, and that is that motion 466 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee meetings be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes decision time, and we'll now move to members' business. Members' business is from Claire Hockey. I'll ask for a few minutes before we start, or a few seconds.